Hello, my name's Richard. Up until last year, I worked for a projection mapping company called Projection Artworks in London uh, for about six years. So we've done quite a lot of shows uh, in using touch designer for a lot of mapping shows and disguise and other things like that. So um, today, we're just going to basically talk about the different mapping tools in touch designer, what they are, how to use them, when, they're worth, when it's good to use them, when it's good to use other tools, whichever tools you think are uh, better for which job. So we'll start off, I'll go through, I'll do a little presentation talking about that kind of thing and showing you through the tools. Um, and then we're going to have a look at uh, some actual workflow. So we're going to have a look at how we, how we can create, uh, do creative for our mapping shows, how we can previs, projectors, and so on. And finally, how we actually would then map that uh, setup. So to start with, we'll do like perspe perspective camera setups, like this sort of, you know, you're, you're just on a straight set. And then we'll look at a more com complex uh, example uh, and try and projection map a uh, space shuttle. Um, so if I can put that back on the sign. Yeah, cool. So I'll start off, I'll just go through, um, I'm going to start off with the presentation. So you guys don't need to follow along with this, just, I'm just going to talk through that. And then once we're done there, we're going to sort of jump in and start doing a bit more practical, uh, hands-on kind of kind of stuff. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, and everyone's everyone's good with assets and stuff. We can get to get started, yeah. So, cool. So I'm going to start off with like um, it's kind of basic to 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 go through, but I'm going to start off with uh, corner pinning. So uh, and the, and uh, using a tool. So the main tool, and I think a lot of you probably already use this in Touch Designer. If we go to the palette, we have uh, in the tool section. We have the stoner. So the stoner is like your entry point into um, projection mapping in um, Touch Designer. So if I open up the stoner window here on the right, you can see that we have a, a simple uh, video that's already coming in. We can put our own video in by using a movie file in. And we can then basically projection map that video using perspective pinning and grid warping. So this tool is kind of useful if you're just doing standard projector keystoning and you want to do like simple blending between projectors, you can use this to just keystone. And if you want to do like poster mapping, then when you do the perspective warp, it will work perfectly as well. Uh, so this, this is kind of the, the, the starting tool. So it has a, if I just open up this corner pinning example, uh, I'm just going to go in uh, to here. Yeah, sorry for keeping all on one screen, but we're recording this. So uh, yeah, so. This is like an example here. I've got a projector up here. I've got my wall. And I have a, what is essentially a poster with a 3D object on the poster. So for poster mapping, this is quite good because it means I can go into this perspective mode. And I can drag my points to each corner. And I can use my keyboard keys. And I can map this fairly straightforward in a very straightforward way. Uh, and that's all good because it's going to start pinning in properly. Now, normally I wouldn't actually show this at the beginning of a mapping workshop, but what I, what I do like people to understand is that this is using a perspective warping. It's doing perspective correction. So if you use the corner pin top, you're not going to get that. If you use the corner pin top, you'll get something like this. If I just zoom in, you can see those lines don't actually fit because it's using linear interpolation. So it's, it's basically saying, for if I have four points and I have a point directly in the center, it'll be directly in the center. If I have a point here at 0 0.25, 0 0.25, that point will be at 0 0.25, 0 0.25 of linear interpolation. But when you do perspective interpolation, it then uses two extra UV coordinates, don't worry if you don't get this for now, that then basically do the, the, the distance point and then it fixes that uh, perspective mapping. That's sort of, this is the most basic example, but that's actually kind of an important thing when we start using things like Kantan and other, other mapping tools. So. So it's just worth understanding that perspective pinning will do everything perfectly for your projector. Linear, bilinear, or linear uh, mapping, you'll usually have to fudge things in and do grid warping afterwards. So, so for simple rectangular or square things, uh, then with where you know the actual sides, this is quite good. And even if you don't know the sides, but you know that the, the uh, print or the 2D canvas matches the, um, the actual projection, then you can always kind of fudge it in and kind of guess where the points are from the print that you have on that. So if it's like a wall mural, you can kind of guess from that. So, so this is like this. This is the most basic tool, um, and it has yeah, it has the grid warping in there. So if we want to grid warp, we can uh, go in and and do that as well. Uh, and one second, I'll just get the hard drive for. So that's that's uh, the first tool. 
in touch is the uh, the stoner. So then, uh, so the stoner does. Let's let's say the stoner the stoner just does corner pinning. That's what it's good for. That's kind of how I would say it. We then have um, there's another tool, and this is a tool that Marcus uh, made called uh, Cantan Mapper. And what I'm going to do is just drag it in, just again, just to make sure it's all good. Yep, it seems to be fine. If you guys are an experimental, this might not work because there's seemingly some issues. Um, but in the official, it should be working fine. So um, yeah, so in Cantan Mapper has a slightly different approach in that the way that Cantan works is if we hit open window, we can open it up and we can see it here. Uh, and what we can do is we can actually like create and draw shapes. So Cantan kind of works similar in a way to how Resolume, if any of you guys have used Resolume works, it's uh, sort of it's kind of similar. Resolume is a bit more advanced and a bit more powerful, but we can go in into tools here and we can either create freeform shapes. So I can just create a shape and then we'll see there we have a shape. Or we can create just simple square sort of uh, shapes as well. Um, so And then we can go in and we can transform. So this is our input uh, for for Cantan, if I just open up the, um, if I just go to the null here, and you can see that from the output here, we get a couple of uh, different textures. One's a UV map, and one is uh, the actual the actual output. So I could send this output to uh, a window. I assume everyone knows about setting up windows in Touch Designer. Yeah. All good. Uh, so yeah, so if I set that up, I can set that to go to another window, and then I can open it in a separate window, and it will show up on whichever monitor I've got. I've got three monitors plugged in right now, so one second. Nope. Is this projector on? <laughs> well, there's a good start. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, so I can open up the output and then it will show whatever I'm, I'm mapping. And if I, wanted, if I want to actually take a texture, like a movie file in, then I can choose, let's choose for example the field guide for now. I can drag that on um, to a, a visual on here, the texture, sorry, the texture parameter, not onto the, I think I'm using the old version. If I drag that onto the texture parameter, then that's now going to be using this texture when I click this little button which looks like it removes the texture, but actually what it does is it just says display that texture. And we can then start mapping our texture on the output. How, how do you get that on the window? Sorry? Yeah, how do you get the window? Oh, this window. So, um, sorry, so if I go into, uh, so when you drag Cantan in, if you click on it, and then there's a little open Cantan window button on the, on the right-hand side. So if I click that, that's going to show up. Um, actually, that's kind of annoying because we've got the, we've actually got like that duct thing or whatever. And the, let me just move it. Let's just move my window over a little bit, just so it's a bit. Is that better? Maybe. You can actually, can you actually read those parameters as well? Because they're quite small. Um, yeah, you all good? Yeah. So we have. Um, so are you guys following along? Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm going quite fast here, but this is more about presenting the tools. We're actually going to start like using them more later on, so it's more just uh so um yeah, so we can add we can add multiple shapes and we can have uh either the same texture or multiple textures in here as well um so here i've 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 attached it to a free form. you can see that it's um it's actually using the grid and it's cutting the grid off. Uh, so if you want to go edit that, you can go into edit texture here on the left-hand side. And when you, we open that up, you've got um, like these tools for sort of changing how your input texture comes in. So for people who've used Resolume before, like it's, you always have that input sort of page where you kind of draw your things on. This is kind of Cant Cantan's way of doing it. It's sort of a bit, it's a little bit clumsy to use, but it, it works uh, quite well. So for things like, like just doing like 2D um, mapping onto cube faces or things like that, Cantan's quite useful. It's pretty good. Um, but it sometimes can be a little bit buggy, to be quite honest. It can be a little bit fiddly. And over different builds, it can sometimes kind of break down a bit. It's, it's, I've never found it truly super reliable. So I kind of, I generally don't use Cantan. In fact, last time I used Cantan on a show was back in 2011, I think. 
so like eight years ago. So, um, so just so you guys are aware, there are it can have its teething issues sometimes. So just that that's one of the things that uh, we need to be aware of when using Kantan. So, oh, you guys all right? Yeah. So, um, so first, so we have our corner pinning tool, which is the stoner. We have our sort of drag a clip on and then kind of move it and do like sort of individual face mapping stuff, which is Kantan. So they're the first two mapping tools. There's another two, uh, which uh, most people kind of use. Uh, this, this third one is a tool which is um, not really, it's not an official derivative tool. It's actually one that a guy called Dev Harlan made uh, called Vert Pusher. And that just allows you to basically bring in a 3D mesh uh, or a 2D mesh and then kind of warp the points on it. So, <clears throat> so if I go into uh, my, which one am I using? Sorry, one second. And as I say that, it's, oh, where is it gone? <laughs> it's somehow disappeared. That's strange. Uh, one moment, let me just pull it back in. <coughs> let me just pull that back. Um, in fact, I'll pull it from, I'll pull it from in here. Let's quickly pull it from that. So, yeah, so anyway, so Vert Pusher is um, basically what, what you do is you bring in a mesh and then you can kind of, uh, you can just warp that mesh. And the easiest way to do that, if I just show you a quick setup now, uh, is let's say we have a, uh, so let's call this uh, Vert Pusher for now. This is a tool I'm actually going to release next week. It's kind of still got a couple of little niggly bits, but uh, I'm going to re-release Vert Pusher because it's, it's had lots of iterations over the years, so it's a bit uh, a bit clunky. But let's say, for example, we um, <coughs> we had a box, and we want to projection map that box. So I'm just going to create a box here, um, and then what I'm going to do is just transform it. Oh, rotate it. And then I'll just bring the tool in one second. It's in here. In my, I'm just pulling it from my show that I used it for. So here we go. I'll uh, I can give you guys this at lunchtime or whatever as well. So I don't know why it's disappeared out of the uh, folder, but um, so yeah. So let's say you want to projection map this box. So we can set up a camera. Uh, da -da -da. So if I make a camera. And I just set up a uh, geometry. So we're rendering from uh, inside the geometry rather than, <coughs> sorry, got a bit of a cough, um, in here. And I just set that to render. So yeah, so I can bring in, uh, so I've got my geometry here, which is really boring. It's just a cube and I have a camera. And I can bring the camera up and just set it to look at. So this is our, um, this is the camera that we would be creating our content from, and this is like the most basic sort of setting up of a camera with a with a with a mesh, and then we can render that out. So we can render using a uh, render t top. So in Vert Pusher, the way it works is you give it the camera. So I give it this camera here, and then you give it a SOP. So in this case, I'm going to give it um, this uh, transform one. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just drag that up here, and then you give it a resolution. So I'm going to say, actually, I'll say 1280 by 720, because I know some of you are using uh, the, the other uh, the other build, uh, the non-commercial. So yeah, so I got a camera, and then if I get it, if I dra drag in a texture, so if I just say I want to, um, in fact, my texture could just be the camera rendered from that position. So if I just actually give this geometry a render, and it's not rendering. Is it? Is it looking at? Have I just dragged the wrong thing on? Cheers. Oh, the geo set to look at the camera. Wow, I'm really going backwards today. Yeah. Okay, camera looks at the geo. Yeah. So then you get like a a, a wireframe, and we can palm that on as the uh, as the texture top. And you'll see here that it shows up. And this is actually uh, the texture here. So if I just change the color, you can see that that's actually what I'm rendering out, not a wireframe in the tool. <coughs> And so when we view that, we can actually go in and we can just drag points and whoa, it's going funky. Yeah, that's because I'm doing some lattice stuff in here. 
Oh, this is a bug with the subdivide. Let me just turn the subdivision off. Uh, there. So what you can do is you can actually warp the mesh that way as well using this tool. So you can kind of bring things in. Um, at the moment, I've got this weird setup with, yeah, it's a, I think it's because I'm not, I'm not deleting the back faces, so I need to just delete the back faces off that. So if I was mapping onto a cube, normally you would just delete your back faces for this, so it doesn't, um, you don't see anything on the background. So if I just do that. Again, I'm just showing this, I'm just trying to quickly go through these before, like, uh, well, before we actually get in and start using them properly. So don't worry if you're not following along too much. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's now actually using the back faces, and the SOP needs to be geo one slash delete one. So if I just do that. There we go, that's better. So now you can actually see it properly. So what this does is this allows you to warp um, meshes just using point manipulation. Um, and the version I'll release next week has like a little transform and a little corner pin as well. So you can kind of just transform things in and then you can move the, warp the points. Um, but at the moment, it's just kind of, it allows you to drag points. And the way it does that is through, uh, through this little trick here where we have a, a bunch of offsets, a bunch of point offsets, and then we take those into a DAT and we add those offsets to, the, um, to this uh, object. And then we merge those back in using a DAT2 SOP. So the DAT2 SOP can like merge, merge point deformations back into the geometry. So that's, that's how that one works. And it's quite useful if you, have like a, if you don't have a 3D model and you need to have like a, a, just a, a big set of like, let's say you've got like a whole bunch of cubes and you want to just like map them all, then you can, just, you, you can just create like a 2D mesh and then just sort of point warp it all back in. So this is quite useful for if you, if you don't have like an accurate 3D model of what you're doing and you're on site and you don't want to quickly like get something up and running. So this is, it, it kind of works for that. There is one problem with it as well, though, is that when you're mesh warping, it, you end up with a lot of um, bad creasing. So if I just quickly put a, a constant on, if I just put a banana, why not? So let's say we have the banana on it. You can see here where the banana's got like loads of horrible um, creasing on it. And if I actually, if I start doing this, see there, there's like a crease across this point. And the reason that's happening is because OpenGL um, doesn't like uh, quads. It basically renders triangles. So when you apply a texture to, op to something and then you start, it's got beautiful UV coordinates, but then when you warp it, that UV coordinate then ends up basically folding on itself because it's going onto a triangle. So the way you can get around that is by using subdivision. So if I subdivide, I can subdivide like four times and it starts to get rid of that warp, that, um, that weird fold in the texture. So yeah, so that's the third sort of tool that we'll have a look at. Um, it will, at the moment, there's, there is a version of it on the forum, which is uh, Dev Harlan's released. Uh, but I'm going to release a sort of more modernized version of it next week, probably. Like, I was actually hoping to get ready for this workshop, but it went a bit, it all went a bit crazy. <laughs> so, so what I'll do is I, 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 can, I can, if you go on my GitHub, like there's actually a whole load of things on my GitHub already, which, which are like mapping related. But if you, there will be a new version of Vert Pusher going on there, which, um, which will have some transforms of perspective. I mean, to be honest, I might actually just finish it today after this workshop. So come grab me if you want to uh, link or if you want to know where, that, where that's going to be. Um, if you want, you can give me your emails, and I can email out where where I'm gonna where I'm gonna put the final thing. Because at the moment, it's just like it just it just does like point warping. But it would be nice if it actually did proper perspective warping and then point warping. Um, so I will uh, I will sh show you guys where that where that lives. Um, so that's the first sort of three tools that you might use. But and then finally, we actually get to the the 3D part of projection mapping, which is uh, using uh, the tool called CamSnapper. And CamSnapper is what we're going to be mainly using today, actually. Um, and that is uh, in, this, in the palette. So in the palette here, I have a whole load of uh, tools. And there should be a one called CamSnapper, and there is. And Cam CamSnapper is also made by Marcus. So if you have any questions about it, you can, he's here you know, downstairs. So you can give him a shout about like, how, how it works and, and, and uh, some of the more esoteric questions about like you know short field of views and things like that and he's 
done a lot of work with it. So, so yeah, so CamSnapper uh, is, I don't know if any of you guys have used Disguise, but CamSnapper is basically Quick Cal in Disguise. It's the same thing. It's, it's using um, the OpenCV's perspective camera uh, tool, uh, the function, sorry, to, to basically take in a bunch of points uh, that you pin on the, on the output, and then it warps that, uh, well, it calculates the projection matrix of the camera, and then that points at, um, at the geometry. So to give an example of it, if I actually, if you open it up, it's already set up, ready to go with a cube. And then, and CamSnapper, you have to like control and click to left click to like tumble, and then middle click in and drag. It's a bit, the dragging is a bit weird. And then you have to middle uh, control and right click to pan. So it's basically control and a free mouse buttons, but don't use your scroll wheel, just use um, the scroll, like click it in and move it, and it will uh, move it up around. And we can also uh, pan. So that's, um, so when, yeah, so that's, that's, if you hit open window, that comes up, yeah. So you open your window and then you choose, uh, you can choose your geometry, your geometry stop on the top here, yeah? uh, or you can just, if you want, for now you can just use this cube. And then we can choose an output monitor. So it actually has a window built in, uh, which you can just then send stuff to. So if I try output one, and I can say um, on the output, I can open here. And then your output opens up. And you can see your, uh, your cube should show up. Is everyone following along? So now that we have our cube on the screen, we need to map our cube. So if we were to click a point, on the main interface, which is on the left here. I'm just clicking on this point. And then I can move my mouse onto the output. And I can actually, if, let's imagine we have a cube there. I can actually drag this, this little crosshair. To, so this is the top left point. I would drag it to the top left point. And then I would add, you have to add up to five points before it calibrates. So if I add like you know, zero to four, you'll see here now we've got the cube is showing up, but it's all mangled because our calibration is completely out, but if I drag it somewhere where roughly it might be, so if I say my four is gonna be roughly around here, and my three is gonna be somewhere else, it starts to try and calculate where that cube actually is. And again, I'm just sort of showing this for now. We will actually get that projector aiming at these models, uh, and we can have a look at, at how, the, how that works. So yeah, so that, that, that's like, so that, and then once you've done those five points, you might need to add more points. You might, some points um, don't really calibrate very well. Some calibrate nicely. It has this little, uh, on, the, on the very right-hand side here where I've somehow gone full screen again, there's, you have this calibration error. And the calibration error, the closer to zero that is, it's like the better calibrated it is. And you can normally see it on the set where it's like if it's a little bit out, you can kind of, you can remove points or add points. But the thing about CamSnapper is if you're using it, never try and do this kind of thing because you get yourself in a whole world of trouble. Like don't try and like just mash it in because you'll probably get in a little bit in trouble because then the next point you add will start breaking things. So just make sure those points line up correctly to your output. And again, we're gonna actually demonstrate this on a 3D object so you can, guys can actually see it in action. Um, you don't. You can actually, uh, so you can go inside CamSnapper and you can actually go into output here and you can right click and hit view. And that will actually open up your output as a full window. It's a bit clunky. Uh, it's designed, like CamSnapper is designed to be used with uh, a second monitor, but you can also say output is part of Canvas. And I think that will open it up. If I say output monitor zero, that's gonna open it up on my Canvas. So I can set like, a small resolution, so they had like 1024 by 76, uh, 768. I could set like a small resolution, I could just play with it in the corner, and then when I'm done, I can hit escape. So you can do that as well. If, if you turn on the um, output as part of canvas parameter, it'll just open up wherever you want it to open up on your output. So that's quite useful too. <clears throat> and there's a whole other load of settings, like for example, if your geometry comes in and you have like really bad, um, uh, like sort of reversed normals, and you can reverse those uh, in here. You can turn off the guides and things. Um, so if I just open, one second, let me just open my output. So you can like turn, yeah, you can turn the guides off and on. You can um, like color geometry randomly or not. Uh, you can choose like a background color map as well. 
there's a few things you can do there. Just they're they're more like just to help you like visualize what you're doing as you're as you're using it. So, um, and you can clear the whole mapping. So if you want to start again, you can hit clear. Um, and then it gets very clever because you also have this auto blending system, um, which I'll show this afternoon, which allows you to uh, sort of just blend multiple projectors together. It's it's not quite disguises auto blending tool, but it does help. So um, as with Touch Designer, mo there's, there's a lot of like things which are sort of it's sort of it's built by Marcus like in his spare time, so it's not you know it's not like built by a whole team of devs so it's it's got a few little weird bits like with the with the auto blend it's a little bit odd but you can you can usually um, you can usually use it and just change the gamma around and it works quite well so so yeah so cam snapper is um, is the is the fourth uh, sort of projection mapping tool in touch that people generally use so those are the four main tools I mean it depends what you're doing like so for, for 2d stuff um, then use the uh, stoner with rectangles if you're doing uh, just you just want to have like individual faces doing stuff so if, let's say you've got like three big uh, sort of like long banners or something you can use Cantan to do each of the three banners and you can put your textures on that if you want to do like a, a sort of setup where you haven't got a 3d model then or, and you know or, or you don't know if your 3d model is accurate because with cam snapper your 3D model has to be accurate, then you can use vert pusher and move the points into place and just point warp it. And then finally, the most useful one probably is cam snapper because you can just bring in your model, move a few points, move it up to five points. And if you've got a really complex model with like hundreds of points, then it will still snap into place. So the shuttle has like a whole load of points and it's all about just finding the features on the model and make and just moving to those features and it will it will pop in. So that's kind of they're, they're, the, they're the tools. Uh, that's sort of the overview of um, of what what you can do with those. Um, oh, there's my mesh. There's my mesh warper. There it is. Weird. So yeah. So that was the example. I don't know why I couldn't find it, but uh, that, that's the example of um, if you move, you can move the points to the point, uh, and then that will start to to map nicely in. So those are the tools. Now the the, the next step. Um, is let's start. Let's go all the way back to the beginning, and let's actually just talk about um, building projection shows. Because the first thing you need to know is, well, a, what am I projecting onto? Is sort of number one, and then b is, well, I'm projecting onto. I'm projecting onto a set or something, or I'm projecting onto a sphere, or I'm projecting in a dome. You know, there's all these different different canvases that you can have. And then the second step is, well, where do I put my projectors and what projectors do I use? And that's actually kind of quite difficult when you use Touch from scratch because there's no tools built into Touch Designer to really help you understand that. You can put in a camera and kind of you, you try and figure out from the, from the field of view. Um, so luckily, we, we, you can build your own tools quite easily. So, um, so I built a tool um, in touch for previsiting, uh, which you can actually, if you want to download, that tool is online. Uh, so if I go to my GitHub uh, and just show you where it is, and the internet would choose to not work right now, always good. One second. Ah, here we go, cool. So there's a whole load of um, stuff on here, and if I just search previs, yeah, so this is a this is a component that um, that I use quite a lot, and it's just Richard Dash Burns forward slash previs is the GitHub link. Uh, so yeah, if you go on the GitHub that I've had before with the repos, it's it's on there. And what this previs allows you to do is basically set it has a projector component built in. So I'll just I'll just go through it, um, and we can set uh, we can we can show how to set that up. So at the moment, here's my previs component. When you when you open up the tool file, you have something like this, and you can go right click on that uh, component, and you can just view it. And it's it's built off um, the Arcable camera in Touch Designer. So has everyone found this? Have you all got it on your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So it was at the very it was at the very bottom. This uh, previs underscore shuttle is the comp oh the tool on here. Yeah, so that's 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 where you can get the sort of it's just got a couple of example bits in it for for running. 
Um, but in the presentation file, you should have it already there. Yeah, cool. So if I right click and view, it uh, opens up and it looks like nothing right now because we're using, has everyone used the ArcBall camera? No? Yeah, one person? So in, in touch, there is a built-in component here, which is, which is very useful. I'll actually quickly show you it, just because it's quite useful. Uh, in the tool section, you have Archibald Camera. And when you drag that in, it's basically what CamSnapper has, the 3D viewer. So if I go right-click and view on that, but you can like left-click to tumble, right-click to pan, and middle-click to zoom in. <clears throat> so it's basically like a 3D scene setup, which you can just drag in, and then you can go in and add geometry inside. Um, so if I go inside, by default, it just has a little bit of geometry in there. Um, so if I want, I can go in and add more geometry. So if I wanted to like a torus, I can just go in, add a torus inside, and not a flow emitter. <laughs> torus. Yes, if I add a torus in, then now you can see that torus is in the scene. And when I go view, I can now tumble around. So it's like, it's a really nice way of having a sort of 3D camera setup without needing to go in and like move your camera, because touch design's camera controls are terrible. So it's like, this is like a, the nice sort of way of, of, of going in and changing your camera. Um, so yeah, so this, that's what the previs, the previs uh, component is built uh, on top of the ArcBall camera. So when I, if I middle click and like I did with CamShop, if I middle click and pull out, so you can see here we have a space shuttle and we've got a bunch of projectors in various positions aiming at that uh, shuttle. And so the way, the way, the way that this works is, um, for anyone who's used Disguise, I've basically stolen their workflow um, in that you have, uh, what well, in Disguise I think you call it a surface, in here you call it a screen, and you have props and you have projectors, um, and you can bring a camera in and just render, put the camera to render and you can see the camera in there as well. So. It's a little bit more manual because, <clears throat> sorry, we're in Touch Designer, so it's going to be very, it's going to be quite manual. So when we go inside, you can actually see in here all of our elements that we have um, for for this previs. So we have a screen, and the screen is like a if you download the previs tool, there's already a screen in there, like a sample, and you can just copy and paste it. And all the screen is is a uh, geometry component. Uh, with an extra special little shader in here called Fong1 GLSL1. And this is just a little uh, little um, GLSL shader, and what it does is it cuts off the texture where there's no projection, where there's no lights. And you can set the light up in there, and you can also add a UV map in there if you want to do that as well. And you can add that here on the top level. So you have the, you have the screen, which is going to be your canvas, what you're going to project onto. And then you can have a prop, which is where you do the em elements of your set that you don't want to project onto. So for example, with a shuttle, we don't want to project on the back, we just want to project on this side. So we only have the elements uh, from, we only have the elements that we want as a screen, and then we have an, the, the second half is the, uh, the prop. And then we have a bunch of projectors here. So we have different projectors and they have setups. So if I actually just go and delete out all my projectors, except one, I'm just going to leave one in the scene. So now when I open up my previous, and what I'll do is I'll move this onto the second screen, just so you guys can see. So there's my previs. So when I go inside, I now have this projector, and I have a whole bunch of parameters on the projector components. And if you want to make a second projector, you just copy and paste. It's, it's just as simple as that. They're just objects in a 3D scene. Uh, so the projector, we can set the resolution. So I could say like, oh, it's a 1080p projector rather than a 1200. And you'll see that the field, the uh, frustrum updates live. So you can see what your projector is seeing. You can choose the lumens, um, which is not displayed, but it does actually uh, help these little parameters at the bottom, which are good for sort of knowing what, what sort of um, looks you have, the pixel density, that kind of thing. And then you can also change your projector lens. So let's say I have uh, a standard projector. The most important thing about projection mapping is knowing your projector lenses and just knowing what, which lens to use for which job. So in this case, we go, OK, we have a standard projector. Let's say that this projector here has a fixed lens. We can't remove the lens. We can't put a new lens in. So we need to set up a, um, need to set up a lens uh, for that. 
that's a 1.2, I guess, because most standard projectors are. Uh, so if I said, okay, I'm gonna guess that's a 1.2 lens. Normally when you're working with professional projectors, you've got all your different lenses, and I think you, a lot of you guys have obviously worked on shows, so you already know, know this kind of stuff. Um, but yes, yeah, so you want to you have the right lens in here, and then that's gonna show you your coverage uh, on the object. And if, and if I bring the lens down, you can see that it's now, it's actually showing the area that I'm projecting on. So I can actually adjust and, and check for uh, that kind of stuff. You guys all right? Yeah. yeah. So you've then got lens offset because a lot of the time your projector actually will have a lens offset. So you've got your lens offsets there and I think it's in percentages. I actually haven't used it in a while. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's basically the same as it would be in disguise. I think I actually checked it against disguise to make sure that it definitely matches. So, um, so yeah, you've got a uh, vertical and horizontal lens shifter there. So you can lens shift your projectors. Um, and you have the position parameter, which allows you to move. And as, it, as it's moving, you can see that it's actually changing where it's looking. And that's because I've also got the use look at uh, option here. So using a look at, we can change where our look at position is. And it's that little green dot in the middle. So if I bring it, if I bring my throw, my focus, uh, my, well, my throw distance back, you should be able to see that green dot, but you can't for some reason, great. Um, and there's a throw distance as well. So you can change how far your throw is on here. Ah, oh, the green dots arrived again. Meters. Yeah, everything's in meters. Yeah. Um, I think which I think most things, if you bring in C4D scenes, you'll want to scale everything down by a thousand um, for this. If you're doing like C4D scenes, you want to bring in a 3D model from C4D, it'll be a thousand times too big. So you want to go like a thousand times smaller. Uh, I think most other software, it comes in fine. This is from Blender, so Blender was fine. Maya, I know, is this matches Maya as well, so it matches most software. For when you're bringing in 3D objects, it's just um, it's uh, just C4D that for some reason. And in C4D, you can scale your project down when you're finished kind of thing and just ship it out as well, so yeah. So yeah, so, so, the, so this is all in meters, so if I say my throw, my throw distance is 15 meters, and these values here at the bottom all update because these are telling me at that throw distance what my uh, values are. So it's not super clever, but it's kind of clever enough to know your lux is uh, something around 190. The area covered in square meters is 52 square meters. You've got 4.7 millimeter wide pixels, so you know your pixels size. So, and then actually there's a new version of this coming out soon where actually you can, like, like in disguise, you can zoom in and see the pixels on the model. So there's, there's that kind of thing where you, you, can, you can sort of get an idea of, um, of sort of what your looks and your brightness is and so on. Obviously looks is a weird thing because depending on your environment, you might need 50 looks, you might need 1,000. Like it's, it's completely, it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to, you, you have to get your projector out and test it on a wall and then like figure out, look at the values in here, see what you think works for you. If you need a brighter projector, you have to obviously fork out more money and all that kind of thing. So, so this just allows you to gauge roughly where you're at. There, there is like a little heat map thing in the version, if you download from GitHub, there's a heat map in there. Um, that kind of gives you a little idea of where where your curvature is, like where the fall off of the projection is and the lighting there because you've got stretched pixels and so on. So you can kind of get an idea from that as well. Um, so, that's the, so that's the general parameters for controlling the projector. Um, and in the visualizer, you've got like things like, do you want to render it? Do you want to see the wireframe or the beam? What color do you want it to be? Um, so you've got different colors. And it's also got this shadow casters uh, thing here. And that's basically, if you want, your, if you want to put it a prop, and cast shadows, you can do that. So if I put in a, like a geometry, I don't know, let's put my torus back in. Uh, let's just bring the torus to somewhere sensible. Oh, oh, where are you? Hang on. Ah, there it is. So if I bring this torus into the beam, by default, is that definitely in the beam? Yeah. So by default, it doesn't actually cast a shadow. Um, because you might not want to cast a shadow depending on what you're, what you're doing. Uh, so, but you can drag it onto here and then it starts casting a shadow. If you want to use multiple objects, I could say like geo one, I could say, oh, I want geo underscore prop. You can just um, separate them space-wise as well. So 
that allows you to yeah you can cast you can cast your shadows so you can see like if if you're looking on it you can actually have something cast shadows onto itself as well uh, so you can see like where you're missing but normally I think it should do that anyway I think it should just do that by default um, so if you're like projecting on cubes or some weird set and you want you're like you have bits of elements of the set um, are shadowing each other you can see that so yeah, oh, and actually, quite an important thing is this thing here. You can actually offset the body of the projector. Um, and I, this, I didn't actually need that until recently. I did a job for Harrods uh, doing the Christmas Grotto, and they had like such a small room that I had to have really like ultra short throws. But the thing is with this tool is that using when you're using ultra short throws, it's like it just doesn't really. Not even disguise works for that. Nothing really works for the, for those projectors. You've got to get a projector out measure it off, figure out what the distance is for that area, and then you've just got to kind of set it up. So what this dual body offset does is just allows you to set where the, project, where the projector beam comes from on the projector. So you can move it down to here, and then you can just set everything manually and use these values to kind of rough it in. So if you know, if you've set a projector up on the wall, you can actually like recreate that in here, which sounds a bit crazy, but like if you're in your studio, you haven't got the big, like, we were using uh, 12 projectors all around the walls. If you're in your studio, you haven't got 12 projectors, you've got one projector. And then you're like, well, how, do those, how does that fit around that room? Then you can just use that, measure it off, set it up in here so it's like measured off roughly, and then you can copy and paste that around the room. Yes? Sorry, yeah. Um, if you go down to the previs shuttle, uh, compo uh, con the container, if you right click and view, It'll open up, but it won't look like this. It'll look like this when you open it. Uh, and you just want to middle click and drag out like this. Yep. Uh, sadly, no. I did have. It's not in here right now. I have built one before where it does actually take the field of view and then does. For, for, are you talking about for like you've got a projector and a mirror and you want to like project onto a table or whatever, like that kind of setup? Yeah. At the moment, there's nothing in there. I I, I can't put it in. I could I could put it in. Yeah. Yeah, because at the moment, I mean, even in like other software, you kind of have to like set it up, and then you have to put your mirror in, and then you have to kind of like make another projector in order to fake that. Which you could do with this. You could set it up so you have your um, your you know your your distance, and then you could set one up at forty five degrees angled to the other one. So you could kind of fake it if you were trying, if you really want to. But it's it's I get it. It's really clumsy. So what would be better is to just have like oh mirror at this size. It gives you the mirror size and everything. Yeah, we could do that. That would be cool. Yeah, that's actually a good shout. Um. Not in this one, no. It has, it has a bit, it, when you put the heat map in, if you add in ambient lights, it will start to like bring up the heat map and it will kind of show like where it's sort of, it almost, it almost kind of shows less, like where the contrast's being lost, which is kind of weird. But uh, no, it's not. It's not really designed for that right now. I mean, it, there's still things to probably put in, which again, throw things at me and I'll put them in. <laughs> it's like it's uh, it's one of those. It's it's all these tools are made by the community. They're not made, you know, by derivatives. So like they're always we're always like adding things in and changing things around. So um, so yeah, I think like once I get the I, I, once I get the pixel stuff in, I'll probably put in um, some of yeah. I could put in some of that kind of stuff. Uh, this is actually there's also cameras coming as well, so camera proper camera setups and stuff will be will be arriving soon. But at the moment, it's yeah, it's kind of it's clunky, but it it kind of works. That's the the thing, and it's free, so you know. <laughs> so so yeah, so I think that's that's the projector. I've pretty much gone through all the stuff for that. Um, yeah, and then uh, actually just to show, just so you guys get an idea of what how it works inside the projector, it's literally just a camera and a light. So uh, if you want to view through your projector, you can set up this second render here called projector view. And that just shows you what the projector is seeing. So if you want to like just sort of kind of roughly map something in and just see what the projector is seeing and see, you know, where the, you can kind of see where the stretch pixels are on that as well. 
just from the fact that there's you know there's this area here where it's clearly going to stretch. So you can you can figure that out from there. Um, and there's a, I was chatting yesterday to uh, Vincent Naples, and apparently he's using this tool, but he's now got it set up so it actually does just a pure projection as well. So there's no, at the moment, it, it does the UV map of the model, but he's got it so it just sets up a projection, so you can actually see the stretch pixels. So we've put, we're going to put that in as an option, as a, like a, a way to, yeah, it's, it, uh, these things are always evolving, so it's kind of like, the, these, this is where it's at now, but we'll put, we'll put more, more, more stuff in. So yeah, so I mean, like, obviously, uh, let's go back. I've closed it down, haven't I? Uh, let's go back in. So yeah, so from this, we can kind of figure out where our projectors go and where our shadowing is uh, underneath. The, for example, in the shuttle, the wing might shadow the, the undercarriage or something like that. Um, and that, that's kind of a, a, a helpful way of seeing, seeing where your shadows are. Yes? Can you move the projector at all? Oh, no, the projectors, you can move it. It's here. In the projector uh, tab, yeah, sorry, it's not the transform parameter. It's the projector tab has a position parameter. And I don't know why I did that, but I did. Um, but maybe maybe we could change that. But yeah, it's, it's this position. If you middle click and move, then there is actually a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, on my GitHub, there's another repository called Mara Light. And that actually has this tool with some sliders and things in. But it's a little bit, it's kind of a work in progress. But it, the idea being is that eventually you just open up a control panel and it's, you've got all your objectors in a list and you can add, remove, like you would in normal software. But um, we, it, it, it kind of works, but it's in widgets. And widgets is like still, when I put it in, it was still brand new. So there's still a few bits to, to kind of work on with that. But. Oh, sorry, so the GitHub is here again. Um, you know what, I'll just put it, I'm gonna put it up on the second screen so you guys can just see it. Um, yeah, let me just one second. Uh, so th this is the previs link, but if you go back off the previs link, you can get to all my stuff, um, so. Uh, yeah, so if you go, actually, on, it's, uh, it's called Mara Lights. So if you go to Richard Burns, and then I can put that up as well. And that, that actually has, that has got the camera in already, but it's kind of, everything's kind of everywhere at the moment, so I'll, I'll, I'll put that in. But if I go Mara Light, here you go. So Mara Light is actually um, a tool called Simple Mixer, which I made with uh, some mapping tools in there as well. So it's, um, you can do full setups, and it's actually got a full launcher in there as well. So if you want to do... Um, if you want to do like VJ mixing, it's got a VJ mixer in there as well. So have a look at that if you want to have a look at um, that stuff. It does. Yeah, we're going to go over that now. Yeah. Um, for people on Mac, apparently the ArcBolt camera is having problems on Mac for some reason. So I've, a few of you are having weird drawing issues and stuff like that. So I'll, I might, maybe I'll just avoid it for the sake of, well, we'll use it, we'll use it, I'll show it on screen, but for most of the time I'm going to just use the geometry comps so we can, so the Mac guys can follow along. Um, all good? Yeah, all right, cool. So. I want to talk a little bit about um, a little bit about set design in a way because there are things that are easy to do in CamSnapper and things that are quite hard in terms of the 3D 3D mapping. So I have a bunch of sets in here, and this is some things that previs might the previs won't really help you with. Um, so I'm going into previs sets here, which is another previs uh, with just a bunch of stuff in there in the scene. Um, so for example, previs won't help you uh, at the moment. Maybe one day we'll put it in, but the moment it won't help you with your focal depth. Uh, so if you have a, let's say for example, you've got these three uh, objects. Is that bright enough? Or is it just because the glare? I'm getting the glare from the window, so I can't even see it. Um, so you've got these, like, let's say we're doing like these three objects here. If you want to set your projector up, let's say this is our projector is projecting from the from the scene. The problem is the projector obviously has its focal its focus point, and so you'll have 
focus on the front or the middle face. Whichever face you focus on will have all the focus, and any other the other sets will not have. So something to c consider when you're designing sets is to make sure that your projector only sees, you know, a, a only has like about maybe like two or three meters wide area between where the plane is, uh, where the, the projection plane is. And that's actually, you can see that on the shuttle, it's not a problem because on the shuttle, we have this really like sort of straight um, projection face, which is just, and it, there's not that much deviation between between where it, where it is. But if you've got really deep sets, just be very careful that you'll probably need to use one projector on the front and then another projector to do the back because you're gonna have focus issues, yeah? So that's like the first sort of consideration uh, when you're designing sets. Uh, another consideration, and this is something that someone actually did to me, is that they set up something like this set over here um, where you can't actually, the set's shadowing onto itself. And generally, it just looks really naff whenever you have a set that's shadowing onto itself. And even if you think that you want to have a set with different projectors, and then there's a projector in the middle projecting on the behind, be very careful, because when we go into perspective camera setups, when you're rendering your content from the person's perspective, they might not be able to see behind, and therefore your camera can't see behind, and you can't make content for that area of the projection. We can, we can look at that when we're setting up our, our, scene, our cube scene. I can kind of show that. So that's another thing to be kind of wary of, is like, don't really go on that route. Other good things, like this, this one here is quite nice because we have a flat surface, and when, whenever you have a client, they usually want to put some crap video that they found on YouTube or something, um, <laughs> and then do some nice mapping around it. Having a 169 square on your set is sometimes really useful for that because you can guarantee that at some point someone will turn around and say, oh, actually, we want to we wanted put this thing on, and you can normally embed it in for like nice like sets like, you know, sets like this one, you can normally just like put a video flat, like flat on, like an orthographical map, and it'll work. But for certain sets, it doesn't work so well. This set here um, is another example for cam snapper is difficult because you don't have many reference points. So you only have you have a curve, and you've got four points that are knowns. Everything else is kind of kind of unknown. So when you're doing a set like this, you have to be kind of careful about how you um, how you actually you know set your your mapping up. So what what we did, for example, we did a we did a job um, onto a, a like a perfect sphere basically, and a perfect sphere is like your worst nightmare, and or a dome is your worst nightmare. And some I'm, some of you might have went to the dome uh, workshop yesterday where it's like kind of setting up all these projectors, um, but for a sphere it's really difficult because you have no reference point. So what you have to do is kind of, when you get that sphere manufactured, you have to make sure that you have reference points on the sphere, even if it's little pinholes or if it's, uh, one time we just put in um, fiber optic into pinholes so we could just turn on a bunch of LEDs inside the set so you can then map to that set. Um, so that's like one, or one option might be to try and do some sort of weird connect kind of, or depth camera kind of um, uh, test, but, it's quite difficult to map spheres, so it's just that's just something to bear in mind as well when you're designing sets and things. A sphere with some cubes around it, great, because you just map, you just calibrate using the cubes, and then the sphere will just pop into place. So there's, you can get, you can make your sphere if you put your sphere on a plinth, you can use your plinth as the mapping for your calibration uh, sort of geometry for that sphere. That's so, no, depending on, depending on set. So if you're like building a cube set, then normally your cube set is pretty accurate and it's fine, it's, it's good. I mean, actually when we did, we did I did the same, this kind of same workshop back in, um, in Tokyo and we just used like boxes, square boxes and we mapped onto square boxes and they were just stuck on, they weren't like perfectly sealed. It was all kind of really rough and it still worked, but it's, as you go bigger scale, things get more difficult. So, for example, on the space shuttle, um, when when I designed this, when I got the model online from the space shuttle, it has this. Um, so it has these little engine bits on the back, and the engines didn't print or didn't come out in the manufacture process. So when I bring my model in, I turn up on site. I've suddenly got these engines that actually are not 
on the model. There's things like that. There's always discrepancies between, especially with set, like really, like if you go to like certain places in the world, the set fabricators don't really follow what you say <laughs> and you end up with something that's not actually working properly. But usually in that case, normally CamSnapper will get to about 80% of the way there and then you can use Vert Pusher or something to just kind of warp things in. But when you're warping, you're always getting, you know, you're getting those diagonal lines, you've got to subdivide the mesh. If you've got like a crazy amount of polys like this, this shuttle has, subdividing the mesh is just not possible because it's too, it's too complex. So, so you can't go down that route really when you're doing, when you're, when you're doing a cam snap. You've got to make sure that you either freely scan it or you have a very, very competent set builder who, and just analyze everything and make sure it's, it's a, it has to be about 95% of the way there in order to, to work. Um, but I mean, I've turned up on site where there's been like, it's not even the set that we made content for before. I mean, you know, it happens. Like this, if you have multiple different studios working on a job, then there's always going to be a time where things kind of go a bit wrong. So, the, which is the beauty of using touch designer to create your content because you can just change the set most of the time, depending on if you're if you're using procedural content, you can you can adapt for those situations. So, so that's what we're going to do now. Has everyone got any questions actually before we move on about set design or anything about uh, you're all good? We're gonna make a new project. Yeah, we're gonna sorry, we're gonna make a new project. We're gonna bring in this cube set and then we're gonna we're gonna start doing some stuff with this. We're gonna start do, basically doing some creative because we've been talking about technical stuff for a while now, so let's go into the All right, cool. So we're gonna start a new project. Uh, what time is it now actually before I start that. All right, cool, we're doing good then. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll spend an hour setting up um, setting up our canvas uh, and getting our model in and sort of decide and figuring out like how we would do that in Touch Designer. So Touch Designer has some primitive UV tools in, but obviously nothing like, you know, Blender or Maya or whatever where you can do clever stuff. So, but for these cubes, Touch Designer is more than enough to, to get the setup. So, so let's start a new project. Let's, uh, I'm just gonna quit out the presentation. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm only recording the first one, yeah. Um, but if we're going to be working on the first, for this side of it, we're going to be working on the first one. And I pretty much ranted on for the first few hours, so we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll go a little bit slower now. I'll slow down, I promise. <laughs> cool. Okay, so in your assets folder, you should have, he says, I'm in the wrong project again. Hang on, one minute, let me get in the right one. Uh, projects. Uh, I'm going into duh, 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 projection. Okay, whatever. I keep forgetting what I call my GitHub repository. Sorry, a yeah, mapping workshop that helps, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so in here, in your assets folder, you should have in models. There should be the cubes. The cube setup should be in there. So you drag that in, you should see a set of cubes. Has anyone got that? So the cubes is a it's just an OBJ file and as you can see it's a it's a bunch of cubes just kind of made together. There's no it's not like a you know a, a sort of watertight empty shell. It actually has the cubes there. So we can use that fine with CamSnapper. If we want to use something with like with like mesh warping, then we don't really want to have the insides, we just want to have the front. But because we're using CamSnapper, we can just bring in whatever model, no matter what maybe normals are a bit of an issue, but normally you can just bring in whatever you want and it's fine. So, so to set up a canvas, um, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to set up a 3D pipeline. So I'm going to set up a camera. And if you hold down control, you can do this just by like clicking. It won't close the op dialog. So I can say camera, geometry, and light. So has everyone got those three? I'm just going to make sure that my cube stop. I'm just going to copy it into the geometry here and delete out the torus. So I'm just going to make it so our cube set up, uh, and I'm going to turn the render flags on for that as well. So we have a cube ready to render. Yeah. Has everyone got that set up? So 
So the first thing with Touch Designer is that setting up cameras is a bit of a nightmare. Um, what you can do, actually, is go into the Geometry Viewer, which is Alt-3, if you're on Windows. I don't know if it's that on Mac. But um, you can go into the Geometry Viewer on the top left here. Uh, and you can actually go and choose a camera angle that you like. So in our case, we want to make a canvas. So our canvas, we want to be able to see all of these surfaces like quite clearly with quite a lot of pixels on them. So we want to just make sure that our camera is in a position where we have like, you know, most coverage of the of the cubes. And what we can do is we can actually just save that view to cam one. So at the top here we can go save view to cam one. And what that does is that just basically says, okay, whatever we're seeing right now, make the camera see that. So it's quite handy in touch to for setting up a quick camera. Uh, Oh, sorry, yeah, so just inside the geometry, just make sure you turn on the render flag and the, dis the display flag. There's two little circles there. You got those? Yeah. And you go to, sorry, one sec. Yeah, yeah. You're on Mac. Saving view to camera doesn't work on Mac. <laughs> OK, I'll tell you what, I'll show you the hard way then. <laughs> so actually, if you want, what you can do is you can, if I just, uh, I'm just going to delete my camera and recreate just so I can show this quickly. Uh, what you can do is you can just move your camera up a bit and then just set it to look at the geometry. And then you'll get something. And if I make a render, sorry, as well, then you should get you should you should be able to like move your camera into a reasonable place. Um, except for some reason. Actually look at's terrible. It's not working, so we can we can rotate the camera in the X not X X axis? Yeah, X axis and then move it up. And that will give you pretty good coverage. So actually yes, yeah, so if you look at my camera settings, if you do something like that, like minus forty five degrees maybe and then bring it up to sort of, actually maybe less than 45, maybe 40, and then bring it up to about uh, seven meters high. Then you should get something like this. Oh, sorry, I'll get those camera parameters on. Out. So you can, so if you just make sure that you have all of the cubes in your render, something like this maybe. We all good? Cool. And then what I'm gonna do as well, I'm gonna bring the light up a little bit just so we've got like, um, I'm gonna bring it up to about 10, just so we've got light on all of our cubes there as well so we can see. So this is setting up our um, our scene basically, our, our cube scene uh, for, for, for rendering. Um, so is, there, is, everyone, is everyone good or we still got some people lagging behind a bit. No? All good? Okay, let's carry on. Cool. So we now actually have our we now have our texture which we're gonna put back we're gonna well we're gonna basically render the scene from that from that from that texture. But there's a little bit of a problem in that when we when we want a projection map with Cam Schnapper, we can Cam Schnapper is a camera. So what it'll do is it'll basically, we, do, we move our points into place, and CamShapper goes, great, I'm the camera. I'm going to move to that position. And then we can use that camera, and we can render our scene from that, and it will perfectly map onto our 3D object. The problem with that is that if we want to start doing, like, let's say, for example, and you don't, don't follow me along with this, but let's say, for example, we used, um, like, we have a bit of, uh, oh my god, where's the primitive stop gone? OK, there it is. So let's say we have a, a, an effect where we actually go outside the bounds of the model. Then, so for example, if I say, oh, you know what, we're going to scale this up or something. Well, the problem now is that when CamSnapper sees that, CamSnapper is going to actually like, make our scene go outside of the set, which we never want to do. We always want to like, have a nice, clean line on the set. So one way of doing that is for us to um, take our 
take our camera here, and then we want to basically reproject our nice little texture that we have, our lovely little scene here that we can see. We want to reproject that onto a new mesh and then use that for CamSnapper. So what we want to do is we want to set up a UV map. And UV mapping is like a whole big topic in itself. But for now, we'll just we'll, we'll talk about UV mapping with the shuttle this afternoon. But for now, we're just going to use uh, a standard perspective camera-based UV map. And we'll go into previs after this just to talk a little bit about perspective cameras, because that's a bit of a topic as well, as well in itself. So at the moment, we have this. So let's say, for example, we want to reproject this, and we just want to map it right now. That's kind of our, our mission. So we have our geometry in here. This is our geometry, and it's all good. Uh, there's no translations. Just make sure there's no translations, rotations in your geometry comp, uh, because you're going to be working at the SOP level. It's just a bit of a, a thing. CamSnapper accepts a SOP, and if there's geometry transforms, then uh, in the geometry level, and it means that it won't actually work because it's offsetting your stuff. So always make sure your transforms are at SOP level for your static geometry for CamSnapper. That's the thing to, to bear in mind. So what we're going to do is we're, um, I'm going to just make a new uh, base comp. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the base comps going to be like our a second scene. So this is our scene for creating content. The second scene, I'm going to call this base, actually, I'm going to rename it. I'm going to call it base uh, mapping, or UV mapping. And we're going to use this as another 3D scene that we can then bring our UV map into. Is everyone good? Yeah. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to go inside base mapping now. In fact, what I'm going to do is probably easiest is I'm going to just kind of copy all of this stuff on the left, the camera, the geometry, the render, and the light, uh, and I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to bring that into base UV mapping, and I'm just going to paste it. So we've got like another scene that's the same scene, basically. So outside is our, our actual visual, and then inside is our, our mapping. Everyone good? Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to delete the camera, because we're not going to use that camera. We're going to use a different uh, camera for, um, we're going to actually use CamSnapper as our camera for this scene. So, uh, and we're going to keep the light for now, just for the sake of it. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to delete the light as well. Let's get rid of everything, and then let's give uh, our geometry. Let's give our geometry a constant material shader. That's a constant material is just going to make sure we have no lighting on our uh, 3D model. It's just going to be. We can just put a texture on it, and it's just going to be that texture with the lighting that we set up in that texture. So it's all it's all good to go. And what we want to do is our, our texture wants to be this scene here. But rather than using the render, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a null. And I'm just going to call this null output. And this is going to be the texture map for our constant in here. So what I'll do is I'm going to go in. I'm going to right click, open up my constant 2's parameters in a floating window. And then I'm going to go back and drag my null output onto the color map parameter. So basically, inside, if you select the constant 2, right-click, parameters, and it should open up this floating window here. And then when we come up a level, we can then drag our null output, our, our texture, onto the color map of that material. So what we're doing is we're basically just saying, take that rendered scene and put it onto a, a constant material. And then we're going to use that as our material for uh, the setup in here. I, del I just deleted the light, sorry, inside. Oh, sorry, there's a light in this scene. It's the inside of the component where I've removed the light. So you need the, yeah, if you just keep a light with 0, 10, 10 on the top level, and then inside we, we have a, a, different, a different setup. All right, so we have, we have our set rendered out from our view that we want to actually make our content from. 
So now what we want to do is we want to just reproject it onto the set in order to do the masking so that when we use Cam Snapper, we've got a nice clean outline around uh, our sets. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're masking everything off basically. We're not going to have any weird stuff going out of the camera bounds, which is what we don't, we don't want that. So, so if I go inside um, the base UV mapping, I'm going to go back inside there. And so the problem we have right now, as you can see, if I go in here, you can see that our, our geometry is like, our, we, can see our, we can see our texture on there, that's fine, our texture's there, but the UVs are completely wrong. And so the way we do UV mapping in Touch Designer is we use the texture SOP. And the texture SOP allows you to do UVs from all the different ways that you would create UVs in any other software. So orthographic, X, Y, Z, or cylindrical. So you can do cylindrical maps, spherical maps, uh, all that kind of thing. So if we go inside Geo 1, uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to turn off the display and the render flags here. And I'm going to lay down a null. And I'm going to turn my display and render flags on on the null instead. So we can kind of put things in this chain uh, and render out from, from there. Yeah. And I'm going to lay down in the middle of that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to middle click on the output, uh, sorry, right click on the output of cubes. And I'm going to lay down a texture salt. And you'll see that we have a bunch of parameters that we can now play with on the texture salt. And so once, once we have a, a texture salt in there, um, then we can basically just set it up to go from the camera, right? We want to we wanna view. We want our texture to look like nice and neat. Well, if we reproject from our camera that we made already onto the model, then it's going to actually just fit everything nicely for us. So we don't have to worry about doing any weird UV mapping, drawing things, doing anything like that. We're just going to have it set up for us. So we're going to go in and say texture type. And we're going to just change that to perspective from camera. And when we do that, it wants us to give it a camera. It says, OK, I, you want. We're doing the perspective from camera, but which camera do you want me to do the perspective from? So we're going to go in, we're going to go right click, parameters, or hit P to open up the floating parameter window. And then we're going to go back up to our top level and drag our camera onto uh, our camera set, our camera name parameter. So I'm going to come up, drag my camera onto there. And what you should end up with is something like this when you see your geometry. It should look kind of like a really weird squash well, stretched up uh, set, yeah? And the reason it's horribly stretched up is because UV space is 0 to 1, but we're not working at 0 to 1. We're working at 1280 by 720 or whatever resolution you might use for your project in the future. So we need to make sure that our resolution is actually set up correctly. Our aspect ratio is set up correctly. So you can either say 16 by 9 for the aspect ratio. I normally just put in the resolution. And it just gives me a perfectly mapped cube. <clears throat> on the, uh, the yes, yeah, sorry, the resolutions on the texture sop. It's that camera aspect parameter. So you can type in the aspect ratio, or you can just type in this resolution. It's going to be the same thing. It doesn't have to be a normalized aspect ratio. It can be a, 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 a whatever you want it to be, basically. <clears throat> Uh, the resolution, sorry, that's the resolution of our texture. So if I go back up, our render here, by default, is 1280 by 720. So because there's some people here using non-commercial, so we're running a 720. So that is what we set as our resolution for the texture. A bit of advice is when you're doing this trick is to actually give a little bit more resolution on your texture than the resolution you're outputting at. Because that texture, when you're projecting from a camera, you're actually like get it, you're losing pixels. So you normally have about maybe like 10% more. And then when you project it back on, you've got 10% more pixels to play with. So when CamSnap is moving around, it's actually adding those pixels in, depending on, yeah. So you don't get, you don't get, you don't lose resolution. So it's sometimes good to have a bit more, bit more resolution than what you output. For this, situ for this situation, we're just going to stick to one, but yeah. Um. Yeah. 
from the from the render. So you can in the render, if you look, if you go to the common page, so every op, every top has a common page, and that has the resolution of the top in it. So for the sake of the render, that's a generator. That's like at the beginning of a network. So that's got a resolution by default of 1280 by 720. But if you want, you can change it to whatever you want. So if I said 920, 1080, it's still going to work. If I even if I said like you know 800 by 600, and then go in here and set, it doesn't work because it's 1280. But if I say 800 by 600, then that's actually now going to map perfectly onto my model. So you can use any resolution you think is whatever your output resolution is plus a little bit more is probably the advisable uh, resolution. But ultimately, it's whatever the projector says. Right? Not necessarily. <laughs> so if you've got one projector, it's whatever your output for the projector is. If you've got multiple projectors, you have to then do some clever figuring out for the resolution. So. Yeah, so let's say you're doing a 10% blend and you've got three projectors, or uh, well, let's say two projectors because I can't be bothered to do the math. You've got 3840 by 1080 pixels, but then you've got a 10% blend, so actually you can probably take off 10% because you've got the blend there. And then you use that as your resolution, and then you make your content from that canvas. And then when you do Cam Schnapper, it you map your two projectors, and it automatically has now 1920, 1080, 1920, 1080 ready to go, and then you do your blend. So you can you can kind of set a big canvas all in one scene, all in one model, and then you, you set that up. So for us right now, it's just one projector looking at some cubes. But we can maybe look at the shuttle. Maybe at the end, we can have a little look at multiple cameras. Because uh, for the shuttle, we're going to have like a long, thin UV map. Well, it's actually square, but we'll go into that this afternoon. But yeah, we're going to kind of look at more complex setup like that. Yeah. So. So um, yeah, so sorry, we, is everyone good with the render? They've got this, their cube set looks like this in their UV mapping section. Yeah? Cool. Um, so now we have a render. We don't actually have a camera, so we don't see anything. Well, the camera that we want to use is CamSnapper. We want to use CamSnapper as our camera. So I'm going to go into the palette, and I'm going to go and drag in CamSnapper. Guys, while, so while everyone's catching up, I'll just quickly explain why that's important that we have this mesh. Um, so if I go into my original canvas now and try and do what I did before with the primitive, so let's say I go back in, I make my, you, don't, you guys don't need to follow along with this, I'm just quickly showing. Um, so I go in, I make my primitive, and I come back. So now when I go into UV mapping, I can go, okay, I've got my primitive like going crazy outside of the mesh, and you know what, I'll just set up a camera just quickly to show that, because... All right, cool. So I got my primitive going crazy out of the mesh, but you can see here that it's not actually now going outside of this um, mesh. In fact, if I just set that to uh, five by five minus uh, what was it minus forty. So yeah, so there you go. So now, now when I do my weird, I'm doing my 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 visual effects are not escaping the set because I've reprojected them back on. So I'm essentially using the set to mask itself. Uh, so we've got a new, we've got like a double render pipeline. One rend sorry. Uh, without sorry, so sorry by def oh, without it, yes. Yeah, so, so without it, it looks like we can see it here. So without it, this is what you get, right? You don't. S it's not. It's not. It's not masking off the set. But then when you go in and you remap it, you get the nice edges that your set has. So what we're doing is we're setting up a render pipeline for our visuals that we're going to create things with, and then we're setting up another little render pipeline and saying, okay, take that visual apply it to the model, and if you, anyone who's used Skies or whatever other tool, uh, media server, you have, a, you have a screen, you have a set, you put your screen, a uh, surface, sorry, you put your surface onto your set, you render it out. That's what we're doing in this second setup here. We're doing a similar kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, so we don't need a camera. Oh, why is CamSnapper now erroring? Great, lovely. I'm going to bring CamSnapper back in again because it's not working. Okay, so we can bring CamSnapper into our UV scene, and let me just delete this. All right. So we can bring CamSnapper back into our UV scene, and we can set the render to look at that camera by basically clicking the render one, dragging CamSnapper to the camera component on there. And you'll see something like this shows up. By default, CamSnapper has like a, a setup there, so. 
So let's actually quickly map it. I'm going to move this projector to look at these cubes, and then we can like have a little look at how that works. So, so the first problem I've got is, right, I've just set up my projector, and it's not in focus. So we need to focus it in. But I'll, So I just want to put up a test grid to do that, and then we'll go into, into CamSnapper. So if I just quickly bring in a movie file in. So there's, there's a load of test grids in the touch folder already. So I can just use one of those. So I can say maybe the field guide. And I can just make a window and send that out just as a test, a test, a line upgrade. The projector's probably got one built in, but I'm lazy and I know how to do this, so let's do it this way. Cool, so there's my line upgrade. And you can see that pixel-wise, we're absolutely terrible on this thing, so um, maybe I can come a little bit closer. Might be better to... Hmm. Let's try about here. So you can see like we're actually using about 10% of the whole thing, but it should still... It should still work. Where's the focus? All right. So you focus in your projector. Yeah, we got enough pixels there to do something with. Why not? CamSnapper, like I showed before, we have to open up the second window, and then we have to map those points in. So what I'll do is I'll just start mapping now, and then when Marcus comes with a smaller projector, we can see it better. Uh, and maybe over lunch, if people want to have a play, they can just come and have a play or something. I'll, we'll set, or you can set your, just plug your laptop in and have a little look. So. So, um, yeah, so anyway, so I have CamSnapper. I need to open my output, so I choose an output monitor, monitor one, and we see that we have a cube. Well, the cube is not what we're projecting, so we need to change our GeoSOP here to our actual set that we're going to use, which is this Geo one, and it's actually this null at the end. So I'm just going to type this in. I'm going to type in Geo one forward slash null one. And we get something really weird <laughs> because we haven't actually done any set stuff yet. So if I open up my main window on the left screen, you'll see our set's there. It looks quite neat, right? We've got, we've got everything we need in order to do some mapping. So um, if I can remember how to use the Tumblr, good. So now we can add points in. Now, in CamSnapper, you can add points anywhere. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I would only ever add points where you've created a point in your 3D model, that's a better place to, to, to do that. So if I go in here, I can actually click a point, and you'll see here, there's point zero, and then I need to drag that, this is where it gets really fun because I can't actually see what I'm doing, I need to drag that down to one of these uh, points on the bottom left corner. And you can use nudging using the, um, using the arrow keys as well to get it perfect. Um, so what I'm going to do is probably get a keyboard in a minute and actually try and do it properly. So I need to add in all my points. So if I add in all my, um, I'm going to add in all my outer points because I'm a professional and I can map from the shadow. <laughs> so I'm going to add all, all these points. And you just click on your output and just drag the point that you like. Um, so I said, OK, so this point's going to be around, I guess it's around there somewhere. I can't really see it, but I guess it's there. I've got point three. Well, point three is this top right one, so I can kind of, actually, that's, uh, yeah, down here somewhere. So that point three is going to be around there. In fact, I can see that one, so that's good. So I can start pinning in point three. Yeah, so anyway, so like where we were just before lunch, we were saying, okay, so we, we need to have our output. So let me just go back into our UV mapping bit with the cam snapper. So I'm just going to just quickly focus this projector with field guide and then output that. And I'm just going to use that as the win as my sort of out final output window as well. But uh, so I'm going to fill location, borders off, open separate. Uh, there you go. Oh. There you go. So that's looking good. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that'll do, that'll do. Yeah, yeah, cool, let's do that. Um, so, yeah, so in CamSnapper, once we, we add our points, um, and then we open our outputs on the monitor. So I hit open output, so now we've got our um, full-on setup here. So I can start mapping these, these cubes. So what I'm gonna do, actually, is I'm just gonna come around and probably map them. I was going to use OSC, but annoyingly, Java doesn't want to actually work on my machines, so I can't use the, ed the editor. So there is in CamSnapper. Oh, let's just take all that out. Everything's going crazy. 
in CamSnapper, there is the ability to actually um, control through an OSC layout. So if you go to the um, page here, Sorry, I've, I've, I've put all my font scaling up as well, so hopefully you guys can all read now. But if you go to uh, the Auto Blend page, uh, that's your auto blending stuff. And if you go to Open CV, that's your CV stuff. If you go to OSC, that's like your OSC input. And there's actually a Touch OSC uh, layout made for CamSnapper. So normally you can just do it on your phone. Um, annoyingly, for some reason, it's not working on mine. So I'm just going to do it manually on the, um, on the output. So. Um, because, because Java, for some reason, Java doesn't want to work. But uh, So what I'm going to do is we've got our output. I've added my points. And now we need to map those points in. So I guess you guys have already like played around with this and you see how to how to map it, right? So if I just get a, one of the things you can do with mapping as well is that if you, um, if for some reason, like sometimes you won't have wi wireless or anything, you need to like actually be able to see it. But you can't, um, you haven't got a, you've, you've got to like get a long mouse and keyboard. You need to get a long mouse and keyboard. I always use a wireless one. Um, and there's a great little uh, phone app which allows you to um, allows you to actually control manually. But I'll, I'll find out what that's. It's called Unify Remote, I think, which is good for doing like remote control of touch. So you can use that too. So for when you're mapping, because obviously you're, you're normally your servers in like another room, so you can't really uh, do much with it. But when you're mapping, you can actually just use the keyboard. So if I, if I nudge with the keyboard, I can actually see where I'm nudging now. And if I want to, I can shift or control or alt, which one? Ah, alt. So I do alt and left, alt and right. I can, if I just have a keyboard and I don't have a point, a, 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 a mouse, sorry, then I can actually just do it via that keyboard. And at the moment, you can see that everything's kind of crazy and I, don't really, I can't really see what's going on. So what I can do in CamSnapper is I can actually go in to the CamSnapper page and I can start like turning off things. So at the moment, I've got Geo randomly. I can turn that off, and I can turn off things like show guides. So now all I've got is the one point that I want to map. And the one point that I'm mapping is the top left um, corner of the left-hand bottom cube. So I can do that with a keyboard. I can just go in, and uh, I need to select it first, which would help. Your window has to be um, active. Oh. And it doesn't want to, let's just remove it and add it again. Something's gone wrong. Ah, my timeline's paused. Yeah, make sure you don't pause your timeline uh, or it won't work. Yeah, so now if I add the point in, I've now selected that point. I can alt click. I don't need a mouse really. I can just alt click and come down to where I want to go. And I can bring that in. And then I can just turn off alt. And now I can do the fine adjustment to get to that corner. Once you have another point, sometimes it's good to map on the shadows, well, but so once you have another point, you can just hit tab. And tab will let you switch through all your points on the output. So you can actually, like without having to use your computer, um, you can just tab through. So at the moment, uh, I'm using number four. And we can see number four over there is the top right. So I can go and just alt click and just move number four into place. It's actually that one. And you want to get the point, the center of that target, right on the edge. Uh, like if you use the shadow, it's actually easier because you can see where the where it's starting to fall off. So I've done number four. I'm now going to do number five, which is the bottom one. And yep, again, all clicking very fast. Get it in. Number six, which is the top. That's already done. I've already done that one, right? Yeah. Number one, which is top left. So I can go up here. And you can see it's starting to come in already. It's already starting to like figure out where it needs to be. And then if I go tab, what else? I've got number two. Yeah, so number two. And it's slowly getting there. I guess I have another point. Yeah, number three, which is the top right there. So that's going to go. So if you have a point which you haven't mapped, it will throw everything out. And look at that. It just banged in there. So that's, um, well. Banged in reasonably well, but it's at such an oblique angle with that projector and so little pixels, it's not ideal, but you know, it's it's pretty much there. Okay, cool. So, so that is how we get a mapping. So what I can do now is, um, yeah. So you can see, like here, this is what is actually outputting now. It's a tiny little cube set because we have such a big projection area, but normally it would be your output. So now that we've done that, uh, CamSnapper has a load of like 
stuff in there, which is like showing. So like the wireframe is showing. You can turn off this stuff and like try and get it to look nice. But what I tend to do is I tend to set up a separate window. And the reason I do this is because I can just set a separate window up with a clean texture. And then we don't have any, we, there's never any chance of CamSnapper accidentally showing up on our output during our show. So like if, if, cause if we, if we use CamSnapper's um, window, then we get all this wireframe, we get the, the crosshairs, we get all the silly stuff. And we don't want that, we don't want any of that. So what I do is I make a separate window. And um, in touch, normally when I set up a window for a single monitor, I just set it to specify monitor, choose it. So in monitor one, for example, I set um, DPI scaling to native normally. Um, and then I set, uh, where's fill location? Um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, I can't, I've lost it because I'm so, I don't know where the, where's the where's the fill location gone. Anyway, turn borders off um, as well. And in fact, I don't know why, but maybe that's just going to work. But and then I need to drag my render. I need to drag my render top onto the window. And then I can say like open as a separate window. Uh, and it's not going to work because I haven't got it set to ah fill. There we go. Sorry, opening size set to fill, right? Uh, and because I've got oh, such bad DPI scaling, it's not actually working right now for some reason. One second. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> for some reason, it doesn't want to work properly on the window. Monitor one. Uh, I'm not sure why. Maybe I'm just going to copy the CamSnapper window because CamSnapper actually has a window here, which you can just copy and paste as well, which is kind of handy. And then you just remove the binds from here. And now you've got a whole new window with your monitor and offsets. So I can just say like monitor one. Uh, he's got some other errors in. Invalid path for the node output. Oh yeah, because that's, that's this. So. And now when I set this and open a separate window, it should not work because something's, yeah, but it should still work. Yeah, I'll close, I'll close the output on the main one. So if I close the output and then go in here, open separate. That's over, hang on a sec. Hmm? Yeah, but there shouldn't be an offset. Even if I do an offset, that's not gonna map, is it? Mm. I'll just use the cam snapper one for now, but normally I do set it up separately. I don't know why it's, I think it's because I've got such a weird monitor set up today, because I've got like two monitors on different DPI scales. Like normally when I do a show, I turn all DPI scaling off. And I normally keep all my resolutions the same, because if you have different resolutions, you get V-Sync issues where it doesn't V-Sync properly. So there's that as well. So um, yeah, so for now, let's just use the second output of cam snapper. Which you can do as well, it's just not the best practice for, um, yeah, for, for doing the thing. So anyway, so I can open output and I can uh, turn off my guides and set my texture up, show my wireframe, turn that off. And at the moment, it's not gonna actually let me turn off that thing, is it? <laughs> it's actually not even possible to get um, a good, a good output out of that. Hmm. Where's Marcus when you need him? <laughs> Monitor one, fill location, borders off, open a separate window. Yeah, I'm not sure what's I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, but normally normally it should be fine. I think it's just my monitor setups. Uh, it's so crazy right now. So hmm? Oh yeah, I can do that. I mean, to be honest, I could probably just go in now and just use a transform and transform it down. It's probably going to work. So if I just transform that, like, is that is that actually mapped now or is it still? No. That's very strange, because we're using CamSnapper as the camera, and there's no offsets. So that's very strange. That that's doing that. That might be <laughs> that might be a bug. I don't know. But normally it works fine. So I don't understand. I mean, I've done this a hundred times, so I don't understand why it's doing it. Uh, uh, if I say native again, let's try that again. No. 
I don't know. Yeah, there is. There's um, automatic from the. Uh, is that it? No. Did that work? <laughs> hmm? Oh yeah, so I go on like automatic from comp top. I don't think it's gonna work actually. I don't. I don't think that's it. So if I bring it down, yeah. I'll bring it up. No, nah, it's all wrong. That's very strange. It's almost like it's not actually calibrated properly. If I open up my output here. Perfect, isn't it? What you can do, if you really want, is hack apart the second output, but for the sake of not taking ages on this, I'm just going to go in and turn off the bits I don't want, because you can do that. Yeah, if you ever have problems with CamShenapper, you can jump in it and sort of fix things, which is one way of doing it, but normally you don't have to. Uh, in fact, the only time I've ever had to is when I've been like making weird custom Cam snapper setups. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so that's that's now showing our geometry with nothing else um, except the texture. Uh, so, and I just need to make sure that's a full uh, alpha, and I can choose the color map to be this. Cool. So normally you won't you won't need to do this. I think it's just because I've got a weird monitor setup. Everything's uh, going going horrible. Um, Okay, so anyway, so that's how you map uh, some geometry, and then obviously once we've done that, uh, we can go in to our original setup, so we can go into uh, the original geometry comp, and I can put in, so like I've been using this primitive example, so what I can do is I could, for example, just use a facet, and a primitive, oh. if I just use this, unique points, and then I can use a transform, and now I can do like some sort of, I don't know, primitive scaling effect, and that will show, hopefully on my output, can you see on my output? There you go. So there you go. So now I'm doing some sort of primitive thing that's quite basic. Um, and then if I wanna, if I wanna like start creating visuals, we can start using uh, this, this setup here. So what I wanna do now is like kind of go through how to create visuals because I, I guess that is that more important for you guys than ever, the other to, the other topics. Really, are just more about like setting up pre like the previs stuff for the shuttle, the UV map stuff. But I think this is probably from a starting point probably better. I'm just thinking about timing because we're running out of time. So I think let's make some visuals that work with our um, our setup here, and then later on, if you guys want to plug into the set, then we can just plug in and people can have a play around. So. So what I'm going to do is um, normally the way I make visuals is I have a bunch of contain a, bu well, a bunch of base comps or containers, and I put my I put my, all my set like my, my scenes in those base comps, and then I have an out, and I just blend between those uh, on a setup. So like I have a crossfader with two selects, and I can blend between. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to make a new uh, base comp called base one, and I'm just going to copy my setup here inside base one. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to put this on my second output. I'm just going to make it a bit small on the back here. Oh, come on. Yeah, there's definitely these DPI scaling issues going on because I can't even resize anything. So like that is not resizing properly. Uh, no, I didn't, which is probably the problem. Yeah. Anyway, we can see that on there, and I'll just focus it quickly, and then we're good. <laughs> so, so this is our this is our canvas, right? So this is what we're going to start making stuff with. So some of the typical tricks that we use in projection mapping are things like you know making faces pulse or using ramps to go around different faces, like circular ramps. So the most simple effect we could do is actually to go into our geometry here. Uh, in base, well, I'm in base one, geo one, and um, we can just start like adding stuff in, right? Because we're just, we're just, this is our canvas. In fact, what I will do actually before we do that is copy to base two and just keep it on the side so we have a, a backup of our canvas before we go butchering it. Um, uh, just these, the, so the, the top setup, the original setup with the, um, 
with the renders? No, the base UV mapping stuff, all this stuff, you can leave out. It's just this bit. It's just the bit that makes our creative canvas. Yeah. Um. It's all good? So what I can do is, like, for example, if I want to just do ramps on my, like, uh, some sort of circle patterns going through or something like, like something like typical VJ effects, um, I could lay down, like, a constant material and then put it on my object, and it should go completely white. And then what I can do is use a ramp top. And we can then just use that ramp top as the texture for our object. So like if I uh, if I make this circular, is everyone keeping is everyone all right? Or yeah. So what I can do is I can make this like if I make this circular, then we'll see that actually the texturing here right now doesn't work, right? It's not it's not a bunch of circles on the faces like I want. So what I can do is go inside the geo one, and I can actually now just texture this uh, however I want to texture it, right? So I can go in, and I can choose whatever kind of texture style uh, UV map I want to make like in real time. So I can say I want to go to face, and going to face is going to like move, um, move everything, all my circles onto faces. And if I translate that, you can see that we're starting to get like, we're starting to get textures like mapped onto uh, the object. In fact, one second, what I will do first, before doing that, I'll facet it. Because if I facet it, then that's going to give me unique points and it's not going to want to do the face thing. I'm not having a very good afternoon. <laughs> Translate 0 0.5 and then 0 0.5. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to do it from an orthographic point of view. Yeah, so actually, sorry, if we just do a texture from an orthographic point of view, then we can send like a trace line uh, up the object. Um, oh, sorry, it needs to be a... Let me just figure this out. Okay, vertical ramp. Uh, we can use our ramp. We can just set up how we want, so we can create like a um, some kind of texture just using the parameters here. Has anyone used ramps before? Yeah. And we could do something like phase it, so I could like uh, put in a a beat chop, and I can phase my ramp. And now we're getting like a scan line of the set. So we can do stuff like that, where you know we've got simple, simple ramp stuff. Uh, if we want to change the scan line to horizontal, we can, yeah, do that kind of thing. So this is like kind of the basic setup. Um, doing so, you can apply textures just to the faces, um, and that's kind of fine. That works okay. But most of what you want to do in, with projection mapping is actually working with the geometry and actually affecting the geometry and changing the geometry. So, I'm. What I can do, I'm just going to copy this base again, so I'm in this other section, um, and just go back to my original setup. You guys all right? So what I'm doing here is I've applied this, I've applied this orthographic texture in the z-axis. And what that means is it's just it's basically just projecting the ramp onto the onto the um, the, the uh, z axis so that then we can just move the ramp up the set. It's just going to like create like a scan line. That. Uh, no, that should be the facet shouldn't even be needed. It's this texture so. Uh, and texture, orthographic, Z. Ah, because you're still rendering from the first node. You need to render from the end of the chain. So when you're working with SOPs, uh, you just need to make sure that you don't render from the very beginning. You need to make sure that you always render from the very end of the chain. So I've got two flags here. So if I render from here, it's not actually going to take into account this texture. It's just going to do its own thing. So now I'm like sending traces around the faces. But then if I do it from here, it's going to take into account my texture. And it's going to actually apply that, that texture map 
to my to my model. <clears throat> so you can do so you can do like fun things with the texture sop where you can just like just do different types of texture mapping and just use ramps and sort of uh, images or video whatever you want to do. You can kind of use that as a technique for for uh, putting content onto your uh, set. Yeah, so what I've, what I've done is I've, I've created a ramp, and I've set up, if you see here, um, on where my mouse is, uh, I've set it up so it's like a long black section with like a fade into white. So that's gonna like create, and you can just set this up, you can just click to add keys, and you can like set that up however you want. Um, and then what I've done, I've set it to vertical, and I've just phased it. So when you phase it, it kind of moves it through the, the it just basically moves the ramp up and down. So you can, if you wanted to make it audio reactive, you could just hook up like an audio device in or something and it will start being audio reactive. So in my case, I've just set it up, I've just hooked it up to a beat. So like I set that at one, now it's gonna go every beat, it's gonna go up the set. So now it's like, now it's like bang, 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 120 BPM going through, so. Sorry, yeah, let me, the facet was just because I was trying to do faces. Let me ignore, let's ignore the facet, sorry. Um, yeah, delete it and just use the texture. So, it's to do it, the facet allows you to make faces individual, but we'll go through, we can go through that when we do the primitive stuff. Um, yeah, just the texture sop, sorry, yeah, because I... So the texture sop, if we bypass it, you can see that our, our geometry has a UV map originally, um, but what we want to do is we want to create a new UV map for our geometry so we can send it, it, visuals straight up it. Um, so to give an example, our geometry, uh, the original UV map is uh, this. One second. So the original UV map looks like, this is a trick to visualize UV maps uh, where you just use the texture as the point number using the point cell. But yeah, so the original UV map looks like this. So it's basically just three squares uh, and they overlay and stuff. So it's not, it's not something you can really like apply a texture to nicely. But what you can do is if we use the texture salt, what that's doing is it's changing, it's changing the texture to whatever the, it's changing it to like the actual 3D model in a, from, from an orthographical view, from an orth orthographic view. But are you rendering from the texture or are you rendering from the cubes? So have you got the blue, you know where the little, little render flag? Is that on the cubes or is it on the texture? Like the, if you look at the, Yeah, you need it to be off the texture. The render needs to, the, so the, the texture needs to have the render flag on, the cubes needs to have render flag off. So if you look at these flags at the bottom, yeah, it's because it goes from the end of the chain if you render from the end. So you have to like keep, make sure those flags, what you can do actually is put a null at the end of your chain, which is probably the best way to do it, and then just render and view from there. And then when you insert stuff, it'll always render from the last. Yeah, that's a better way to do it, to be honest. I'm just really lazy and uh, keep changing it. Yeah, so so that's how you can like create, so you can, put, you can apply textures and stuff using that. Um, when you wanna start doing 3D stuff, it gets a little bit more complicated because you have to then start using SOPs and doing uh, sort of transform operations and so on. Um, the easiest SOP to work with is definitely the primitive SOP and it's probably the, like, the main SOP to use when you're doing projection mapping stuff. So the primitive SOP allows us to, um, to basically, manip we can transform um, any sort of attributes, uh, and we can also, like, we can use it, like, as a way for, um, sort of, we can, we can use the primitive index to, like, drive things like MoGraph style effects as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna start off by just like showing how you can like set up the primitive as a sort of. Sorry, yeah, the primitive after, sorry, yeah. <laughs> so you wanna put a facet down and then put the primitive stop down, yeah. 
And then we want a null for rendering. So we're going to render from the null. And the facet, what the facet does, so if I just scale down my primitive salt. OK. So the facet, what the facet salt does is if I turn on unique points, what it, it's basically taking each of my, so I have like one vertice on all my, all my faces, and then all my faces are connected together. What the facet salt does is it disconnects all those faces when you turn unique points on which means that when I start scaling my, a primitive is a face, so a face is a primitive. So when I start scaling down a primitive, it's now scaling my faces, but they're not connected anymore. So like without the facet sop, they're all connected together, so we get this kind of weird um, sort of shape effect. But when they're not, we get our faces as individual faces. Does that make sense? Everyone's very quiet. So we can, so like if we want to transform the cubes, make the cubes go smaller and bigger, then we would use a, tra um, we could use a, a transform uh, SOP and, and split them out individually. But if we want to use, if we want to just like make our faces scale, we want to use the primitive SOP. So for example, now if I go back, um, I could like put a wireframe on this. And you'll see that now I've got this like wireframe effect. Uh, and if actually, if I just switch out my, um, if I just open this up on the second screen, so you can see. So now I've got like this kind of wireframe that's just sort of doing nothing right now. But again, we can animate this. So we can animate this with beats. We can animate with audio device in. Uh, so for example, if I, um, I can use an audio device in. And for the sake of being, uh, for simplicity, I was going to analyze it to the RMS power. Uh, and then what I can do is, at the moment, it's a very low value because I'm just using my microphone. So I can just math that up to something crazy. So I'm going to use the math range. And then I can, from there, if I set it to actually maybe 500 because that's too high. So if I, like, if I, if I rearrange that value in my math, I can then actually drive my scale uh, from an audio reactive point of view. So if I do that. So now as I talk, our mesh is uh, animating. So it's a live audio react, well, audio reactive visual just from using a wireframe. So at the moment, we can still see the back faces um, because at, we're, we're rendering the back, the back, everything that's in the geometry is rendering. So one way to avoid that would be to actually just delete out the back faces uh, and have a separate mesh, which is the same size, but actually just has the shell. So that's one way of doing it. Um, another way of doing it is just by hiding the back faces by actually um, applying like a constant black shader, which sits a little bit behind, and that's like a cheating way of doing it, but it works. So if I want to, I could create like a. Um, actually, I'm not going to use the material sop because that's bad practice. I'm going to create a new geometry comp in here from my um, from my facet. Oh. And what that what that geometry comp is going to be is just a static black background that my geometry can then animate around. So if I double click and make a constant mat and make it black and apply it, then now you'll see that we don't see the back faces anymore. And the reason we don't see the back faces anymore is because we're now rendering two different bits of geometry. We're rendering a piece of black geometry that's just a mask, and then we're rendering the outlines through our primitive sort. And if we want to make it a little bit more obvious, we can actually, so if I move that back, you can kind of see it. Uh, if I move it back, yeah, so you can kind of see the, fa the back faces come back in, but then when I move back to zero, the back faces are gone. So that's like kind of, so now we're like, we're starting to use the geometry to actually create uh, content as well. And a lot of these tricks, a lot of these SOP tricks, uh, I've actually got like a YouTube tutorial video which goes through a lot of different SOP tricks with texturing, doing primitive point stuff, like moving things around and kind of changing, you know, how it how it all comes together. So and and one of the and obviously like once you've once you've done that, you've got your, you know, you've got your geometry here, you've got your canvas, you can start to like play around with that in the post processing stage as well. So if we want to add a glow, we can now like add in um, if I add a blur to itself, then this is, should be kind of glowy now. Um, but I'm viewing the wrong thing, I guess. 
or the glow's just not showing up because that projector's so um, strange. But yeah, I need to reorder. Yeah, so you can you can add you can add like a glow in as well. Let me just reorder this so I get rid of the black because it's uh, causing some problems. So there's like there's like little post of post tricks that you can use as well with with creating. It's kind of like it's a it's a huge minefield. This is the problem with the content creation is obviously like you, whatever you want to make is is it's sort of you've you've got different techniques for doing it. And in touch designer there are so many different ways. So you have like applying textures, then you have this sort of you know applying sop um, like doing sop uh, things like geometry manipulation. And then once you get out of geometry manip manipulation, we're now into the post-processing pipeline. So now we can do things like, like you know, if I want to do a feedback loop, I can go in and I can actually now do a feedback loop on my geometry that I modified. And now it's, you see, now it's painting. And if I bring my level down, so now we can use feedback to create sort of crazy line effects and so on. So there's a lot of scope for, for doing that, for, for what we can do there. I mean, is there any kind of creative thing that anyone's really burningly needing to know how to make, or is it? Yeah, so actually we can set up, let's, let's do that then, let's set that up, that's probably a good, uh, a good shout. So let's, I'm just gonna copy and paste this base again. So let's start from scratch. Um, so at the moment, we actually have a light in our scene, which is this light here, uh, light one. And light one, at the moment, it's not casting any shadows because there's no shadows set up. So in the light uh, shadows page, you can actually turn on, you can turn on hard or soft shadows. Um, in fact, let me just get that visual up so we can actually see it properly. Oh, so we can turn on the shadows if I just resize this again. There we go. Yeah, and once we turn on shadows, then we can start, sort of start playing around with where the light is. Uh, so you can see there, it's now casting, it's so far back, it's not much of a shadow, but you can see here that now when I go up, I'm getting like weird, not the best shadows in the world because I'm just, it's a little bit too close. But I'm starting to get the shadowing uh, from the light as I move it up and down. The best way to set up lights, to be honest, is to be in the geometry viewer and actually like view things from this point of view. Because in the geometry viewer, you can actually see my light is here. And you can start to like decide how you want that light to be controlled. So the simplest way to control a light is to use a path and make the light follow the path. Because that's uh, sort of, in touch, it's quite hard to use these, you know, these controls here where you're not really moving things around. So what we can do, so let's say for example, I wanna make a circle I can make a circle path that goes around my object, and then my light will just follow that path. So, um, so what I can do is I can make a circle. I'm going to set it to be a Bezier curve, uh, sorry, a NURBS curve, and then I'm going to right-click and open up its parameters, and then I'm going to go into the geometry viewer. And when I'm in the geometry viewer, in fact, I need to make it renderable as well. So these flags are really important. They need to be on the two render and display flags. And then I can see my circle here in my 3D viewer. And I can start setting up my circle. I say, okay, it's on the wrong plane. So it wants to be on ZX. It wants to be a higher radius, maybe. It wants to be higher. So I want this light to circle my set. And so I can basically, yeah, I, I've, now got, I've now got this sort of circle, which, and my, my camera, I want my light to follow around that circle. So at the moment it's closed, so I can set it to an open arc, and that's just gonna make it a sort of wireframe. If I go into wireframe mode, well, you can see there, it's just like a path that we can follow. And then what I can do is I can actually just attach my light. If my light has no transforms, then what I can do is I can say, make it on a path, on the path cell. And now it's actually gonna follow that path. And, I, and we can see that if I right click on my parameters here, and go to geometry viewer, we can see that when I change the position of the light, it's now moving around my set. Yep. Sorry? 
Oh, because I'm not using the output at the moment. Sorry, I'm just I'm just showing uh, the visual. I mean, I can put it on the output if you want, but it's not mapped properly right now because <laughs> of the my DPI issues. I think once we once we get some made, we can maybe like all huddle around and just make some stuff. Yeah, it might be quite cool. Um, without without the extra. M yeah, normally it'd be fine. Yeah, yeah, it'd be fine. Yeah. So yeah, so anyway, so I can send lights around, and you can see that lights in Touch Designer don't look very nice by uh, by default. They're not the nicest lights in the world. So if you go into light, at the moment we're using a point light, uh, but we could use a cone light. Uh, and the problem with the cone light is obviously the cone light needs to look at something. It has to like look at an object. So at the moment, my cone light, you can see here, well actually, it's a bit annoying because my cone light's just like not even, it's never looking at my set because it's just following the path. So what I want to do is we want to use the look at parameter and we want to look at our set. So we can do that by going back to the network editor and dragging our set onto the look at, and now it's gonna look at our set. And sometimes when you're looking at the set, it's not very good because it's just looking at like the, um, it's, yeah. So, so actually what I tend to do is I tend to use a null, and then I make it look at the null instead, so I can look at the null, and then when I go back in my geometry viewer, I can now uh, adjust, oh, I need my null, sorry, my nulls parameters, not my, I can now adjust my null to be the look at of that. So if I sort of move my null up or down, you can see there it's now starting to look at wherever my null is in the scene. And I can kind of figure out where my null should be and go, okay, well I want it to be sort of about there, yeah? And then my lights clearly, it's a cone light, so it's, it's only seeing that small area. So in the light settings, we can now set it up to have a bigger cone angle or something and maybe a, a delta or a fall off, you know, that it's kind of different. Um, maybe we want to change the color, so we can set all these sort of settings in the, in the light comp. And then when we follow the path in my, uh, sorry, my light, when I follow my, when I choose my position, we're now getting the shadows going across our set. These are hard shadows, so you can do soft shadow, I mean soft shadows looks a bit like this. Um, it can look a bit crap sometimes, soft shadows, because they are, uh, yeah, they, they, they have to change, set the resolutions up and sort of fiddle around with the settings to get it to look nice. But uh, yeah, we can do, we can now do hard or soft shadows, and we can set the resolution of those shadows, because if you want to go like have a really nice crisp shadow, you want to bring the resolution up to about 4K or something. So if I bring the resolution up, then we're going to get a much crisper shadow, and that's for soft and hard. Um, it'll, it'll adjust. The light, the light can look at the geo, but the problem with the geo is it's, it's um, when you have when you have a geometry, the origin could be like all the way over here, like you know what I mean. Like if you have geometry, it could be like the origin of that geometry. The transform handles like somewhere else, and when you look at in touch, it doesn't look at the geometry. It looks at the the pivot, the transform where where the pivot point is. So actually, what what's probably better is to use a null and then just move the null to where you want it to be in 3D space. So if you say like, oh, I want my null to be actually in the middle of the geometry, then we can actually set it to, to go to that point. If you want the camera to look at it, you can do that. But the camera, in this case, we want the camera to always be static because we're gonna, because we're gonna put it onto a map, yeah, onto a mapping. So it's, you always want, you don't really wanna move, unless you're mapping a moving object, you don't really wanna move your camera when you're mapping. So yeah, sorry, so, so yeah, so we, if you look at the null, then it's better, and actually the null, if you want the null to be in the center of the geometry, you can actually type in, op geo one, this is a Python expression, dot center dot x. Oh, why, what's wrong? Oh, has no attribute center. Oh, sorry, geo one, it's not geo one, it's the SOP inside, it's the facet. So I say geo one forward slash facet one. Sorry, yeah. So you can actually look at the center point of a SOP if you want to. Uh, and that's not the pivot point, that's the actual center of the 3D object if you take the bounding box and find the center. So that's quite handy as well. So that's, that's a useful expression if you ever want to look at the center of something. Um, so yeah, so now, we, now we've got like a light and we can move around. There's, a, there's one thing that's annoying about touch is that obviously um, when you render from Cinema 4D or something, 
you always have um, really nice ambient occlusion. And in touch, we don't really have nice ambient occlusion here because we've, you know, we've got like just a standard light on a on an object. So one nice trick with uh, when you're when you're uh, rendering sets is to actually use what's called screen space ambient occlusion, which is SSAO. Now the first thing I will say about screen space ambient occlusion is that it's really heavy. Uh, in fact, you can see here it's uh, how much it's cooking. It's taking 1.4 milliseconds, which sounds fast, but actually that's quite slow in touch designer land. We, we only got 60 milliseconds to get everything out the door, so we want to have something light, lighter than that. So what we can do is we can actually, um, we can set our settings up for ambient occlusion. We can like make it look you know, quite nice and get those uh, sort of center, center areas looking nice. So that's, you can see there, no ambient occlusion. So no ambient occlusion looks like that, and ambient occlusion looks like this. So we're just adding in those nice little shadows. Uh, and if you want to get rid of this cooking, this heavy SSAO, what we can do is we can actually just render out only the ambient occlusion. And if we want to use it, we can actually just save it as an image. So I could just save it and then bring it back in. Or I could just lock it. And then I could just composite it by multiplying it back with my original set. And now we're getting that ambient occlusion for free. We're no longer actually calculating it. We're just actually um, applying it. So ambient occlusion is kind of a, a, big, a big sort of topic because when you're, when you're projecting onto like live sets, you really need it. It's, it's, it looks terrible when you just have flat, flat objects. So um, when you start using a physically based rendering, the ambient occlusion like just comes for free to a degree because you've got a lot of ambient occlusion already in there. But the um, the SSAO top is still a good way of, of kind of making sure you've got you've got that going. Can you tell us that you set that up again? Yeah, sorry. So what I've done is uh, so after the I'll just I'll just delete all this. Uh, so after the render, I've just right clicked in there, and, and it, the, the SSAO has to come after a render. It won't work with any other op. Um, so after the render, I've just set it up, and what I've done is I've basically just said I've brought up the radius because the radius is quite small by default. So I brought the radius up. And then I brought the contrast down. And the contrast down just it's it's it's, it's kind of like it's trying to make it that like subtle look rather than like too crazy. Um, and if you want it to be higher resolution, you can go like full resolution, bump up the sample rates, um, and you can choose a surface avoid angle. You can like kind of just fiddle with the settings to get the right look. Um, and then once you've once you're happy with it, you turn off combine with color. And then you just lock the node, and you can multiply it with anything you want. And then that just gives you your nice, your nice sort of shadowing in in the scene. Does that make sense, everyone? Yeah. Oh, that's so the light. I've made a cone light, uh, and I'm. Yeah, there's no ramp on it anymore. I'm just using I'm just using the standard Fong material, so it's just like the standard material. There's no material attached to geometry, and then and then what I'm doing is I'm, I, on the light, I'm just basically saying the the it's a cone light, so I'm using the angle, the lighting angle, and the delta. Yeah, so the cone it's if it's a cone light, you get that nice kind of fall off rather than using yeah the normal lighting. Um, and yeah, and then obviously, if I want to start again, if I want to animate this, I can. If I want it to like flash to the beat, can, I can bring in a beat chop, and then I can use my position to, you know, do some kind of beat stuff. Maybe, maybe I want to be on every beat. So now it's like crazy flashy. Every beat, it's gonna spin the spin the light around. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm going to go next. That's my next, uh, my next thing. Yeah, trace lines. Trace lines are a little bit of a weird one in touch. They're a bit. Of, I've actually, I can actually release for you guys. There is a, there is a. Tr I have started making a trace line making tool where you just click points and hit go add, and it just creates a trace line. Because in touch, it's it's a bit of a nightmare to make. But I'll show you guys the manual way, and then it's it's uh it'll it'll you get you guys can figure it out from there. <laughs> so. Is everyone okay before I move on to trace lines? What, what time are we at actually again? I keep putting my phone in my pocket and I can't find. 2.30, all right, cool. 
because I want to go on to UV mapping soon again. Okay. So, um, okay, so what, let's, let's go on to doing, let's do trace lines and then we're going to go on into showing how, how to do, how UV mapping would work in, um, in a, on a larger scale. So, so I'm going to copy my base again. If you guys want, I can give you this, I can give you this file at the end of the day so you can actually take this apart. Um, it's, that's absolutely fine. So I'll put it, what I'll do is I'll put it in the GitHub repo so it's just the final finished files there as well so you can, you can see all this. Because I know it's quite fast paced, so yeah, we've got. Cool, so to do trace lines, um, the easiest way to do a trace line is to use the carve sol. So what I've done is I've made my, um, I've made my standard setup again, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna carve it. And when I carve it, you get some lines. Uh, and let me just go to that visual actually because I'm still on. So when you use the carve, um, the carve basically just has, it has like two parameters that you need to use. Uh, and what, what I'll do before I, before I get into that, what I'll do is just add, add a wireframe mat, and I'll just set that to be, yeah, yeah go for it, yeah. Go wild. <laughs> you good? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I just added, all I've done here is just add a wireframe and I've just actually given it a bit of line width so we can see it a bit better um, as a material. And then in the, so the carve stop has basically two parameters. It has one which is enabled by default called first U. Uh, and when I move that, and for some reason I'm rendering the wrong thing. One second. Am I rendering the right thing? I don't know, one second. Ooh. Okay, yeah, sorry, let's go back to that. So we have the first U, and when I move that, nothing's really happening, but you can see that something's happening in the SOP. If I turn on second U, then now you're starting to see something happening. And what's actually happening here is where we're actually taking each line in the jo each edge in our geometry, and we're we're sort of going through from zero to one, and we're going okay. We're gonna we're gonna start bringing that geometry with that edge in, and we're gonna start creating a line. So we can create lines using the carve sop. That's the main um, the main way of doing it. Obviously, this is quite boring, and the traditional way of doing trace lines is to have a line that goes up around the geometry. So we can still use the carve um, the carve sop for that, but it's a really esoteric thing in Touch Designer where we have to actually choose the points that we want to carve along. So if I go with home all and I go display options, I can actually display my point numbers and we can see that we have uh, all these like loads and loads of points in this mesh. This mesh is not actually the best for, for doing traces with. Now this is where the facet SOP can help us again because just as the facet SOP can split things, it can also bring things together. So where we have two points on, I mean that's probably really hard for you guys to see actually, but I've got two points here, which you can see there, like it, there's two point IDs together. So there's, there's two points in one space. So what the facet SOP can do is it can consolidate points, it can merge, it can like merge points, weld points together, so it can, it can do that as well. So we can use uh, consolidate points fast to basically consolidate our points, uh, like where our points are doubled, it's gonna make just one point there. So now we've got like these lovely numbers that I can then go in and see, so I can see there I've got like, this is 22, 28, 9, 37, and to make a trace line, what we have to do is you have to use um, the delete salt. And we have to delete out all of the points except the points we want to use uh, and create the line from those points. So it becomes, like quite, it becomes quite clumsy quite quickly because we're trying to sort of play around. We're in touch, you have to do everything like by the components. There's no quick way to do, to do those things unless you build the tool to do that. Um, there is, the, I, I have got like a tool where you can kind of like click, but it's, it's still a bit clumsy. So once it's, once it's polished up, it'll be on my GitHub and it'll be free to use or whatever, so. But what we can do for now is we can delete the um, points that we want to use. Uh, so I can do that by basically deleting out, um, 
I can say use number on the delete sop on here. And then I can choose the point numbers I want to delete. So I can say, okay, I, which I want to use. So I can say, okay, I want to use points. I'm going to make a trace line. I'm going to use point 23. I then want to go to point 21. I then want to go to point 9, then to 37, and then to 36. So I've just made a trace line. Uh, and if I sort of delete, I have to delete points. I have to delete the non-selected points in my delete sort. And you can see here that what I've created is actually now two triangles not align, which is a bit of a problem, because that means that when we actually trace it, we're not tracing from the bottom to the top. We're actually tracing around a random piece of geometry that we just deleted out. So one way to get around that is actually to convert uh, our, um, our geometry into a DAT and then we actually reconvert that into geometry. It's a really weird way of doing things. But we could then say connect, um, connect all points. And I turn off closed. And now I've got a line rather than, um, rather than the, the triangles. But even that's clumsy because now when I start carving, I'm not carving from the bottom to the top. I'm carving in a weird point order. So then you have to start resorting your point order as well. So it gets it, this is like how horrible touch designer is to use on the geometry level. It it can get really really confusing and heavy. But once you've done this, you can make tools that allow you to to, to work faster in the future. So um, so in this case, in order to do this, I have to reorder my points into the right order. So in here now, I've got these points. And when you delete points in Touch Designer, what it does is it renames the point numbers. <laughs> so I, I can't just say, OK, I want to go from 23 to 21 to whatever. I've now got to remember what order I had, and I've got to actually put those in. And, uh, and in fact, me and Miu did a laser show two days ago where we were actually doing that. We're reordering things. So what I can do is use the reorder dat to reorder my points into the right order. So I can say, like, before, uh, so I can use replace by uh, indices. Uh, or it's specified order by index, and I can choose the order of the points that I want to go for. I always want zero to be first because I'm using rows, and then I basically take the point number and add one to it. So I say like I've got what, point two is three, one is two, zero is one, four is five, and three is four. And what that does now is it reorders my points into the correct order. So when I put them into the DAP two, I uh, probably put it. Let me guess. I've done it in the wrong order. I should get a nice carve, but I still don't because I've done something wrong. Oh, rows. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. I have to reorder my rows, not my columns. So now when I carve, finally, after all of that hassle, I finally got a trace line. So that is. <laughs> This is this is this is this is the problem with creating creating things in touch is that you you have to go really really deep in to to start like creating nice jump geometric effects. Now there's, there's a few people have probably released tools that make that easier. There's a lot of like you know free tools out there for doing like you know geometry manipulation. There's a lot of instancing sort of things that people have made for instancing geometry, so you can do like cube things going through. But yeah, touch is, it, it's always, it's, it, it gives you the bare bones access to everything, but it doesn't give you the tools on top to actually make that really efficient. So it's up to you guys or up to the community to build, to build those tools. And surprisingly, nobody's actually made a trace line clicker yet for some reason. I mean, I had, I've had a couple and then I just kind of haven't released them, but yeah, that's something that you know, could be released, I guess. So yeah, so that now that I've got my carve, I can you know I can animate that, um, you know I can sort of send that up a beat, and that is just one trace line. I mean, if you want to do lots of trace lines, then you've got to like really go through and start like creating loads of content. But that that that's the, the basics of how you would start making that. Yeah. So, you know, we never never really said this was easy, you know. So. <laughs> So yeah, it, so it, that, that, it works though, you know, we, we have a trace line. And if you want to carve it off, you can carve it off as well. So after you've done your carve on, you can have it carve off so it kind of follows along. Um, but that's another complicated topic. So is there any questions before I move on? Ha 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 ha. All right, yeah. 
tip number one on if you're going to projection map something is make sure your output resolution is correct. All right, cool. So we have a space shuttle. All right, so so what I've done here is just I've just mapped this in uh, like we did with the cube. It's the same thing. I chose some points uh, on the model, and what we can do is let's say we want to do the same thing like as we did with the cube. We want to like send a light around it or down it or whatever, then the way we would do that it, with the space shuttle is slightly different because we have a few problems when we're projection mapping something like this in that, first of all, if we use a camera down here, we're going to get like lots of stretchiness on the wing because we've got two angles now. We're not, we're not just, it's with a cube, we can kind of like fake it. But if we want to do it from like the perspective of an audience, so let's say the plane is like the shuttle's up here, and we want to like look at the shuttle and see everything from a beautiful angle, then that's all good. But then the, the wing's going to start shadowing when we project our camera from our from our audience point of view. We're not going to be able to see the actual wing, the wing section, and so we can't actually UV map it. So because we're going from a camera, so there's so when you do some some shows you do with camera perspective mapping, and some shows you do with UV mapping. And a UV map is basically an unwrap. It's almost like when you see a pelt, like you know, like a fox's pelt or something, and it's kind of splayed out. That's basically what we do: is we take a, a model like this, and then we kind of split out. And it's a really is it's a dark art. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I think it's the the best way of saying it. So for this one, what I did, and I, I'll quickly show you guys the Blender file. And say, I'll just show it on here first. What I did was I actually I projected down. Uh, I set up a camera and I did a camera projection here, and I did a pro camera projection from like here, and then I had the seat. There's a seam down this bit because the two sections don't quite fit. So all I did was I've kind of like fitted it as best as I can in order to try and get that to work. And if I show you guys, I'll quickly. Blender is the best tool for this kind of thing because it's free, and the new version is really good for UV mapping. So it's it's actually quite a cool uh, setup. And the model with the the Blender model is actually in here somewhere. Oh God. Hmm? Yes, yes. This was all done in Blender. So I, I actually I downloaded the shuttle from online, and then I kind of went, okay, what's good and what's bad. Uh, it had loads of really bad normals. It had some dodgy faces that like needed kind of cleaning up. It had a there's a, there's a really horrible thing in projection mapping. Uh, where your faces are like non-planar. So imagine when you projection map a physical object, you have to projection map. Like let's say we're projection mapping this wall. Well, we know that there's, this wall is a physical thing, but obviously when you're doing modeling in 3D, what you can do is you can have a quad that's something like this, and it's not, it's twisted. It's sort of twisted. Um, so, uh, and I think, is that non-manifold? I can't remember what they call that geometry. Uh, but yeah, but basically, when you have a twisted face, you can't physically build it. So you have to be careful when you're making meshes or sets that you don't have any of that kind of um, it, it, like sort of weird warping. And I actually screwed that up once. I did a show, um, I did a show for Top Man in their flagship window, and the set designers came, and they'd actually had a crease because I give them a model with a, a face that couldn't be created. So you have to be quite careful about about that. One, one thing to do is just triangulate your meshes and then you know that that face is, if that face is bad or not. So yeah, so um, if I just quickly go into, uh, into here and go into my summit, where's my GitHub again? What do I call it? Mapping Workshop, yeah? So in the Mapping Workshop folder, in the, I've got a Blender folder, and in here I've just got the Blender model. So if you want to have a look at it in Blender, you guys are more than welcome to do that. Um, so this is it in Blender, and what I've done is I've split it into two meshes. One is the white section of the shuttle, and one is the black section of the shuttle. So if we wanted to texture map it, we can do that. And that's another thing is that obviously the shuttle has it has a uh, it has a logo here, it has a logo here. When we're doing from a perspective camera, putting those logos on, we've then got to corner pin our logos and stuff, and it's really nasty. So what I've done is I've actually because I've done it flat projection here and here. We can actually put our logos on just in Photoshop or whatever, and it, it works really well. So to show that, when I go into the UV editing tab, so here is our UV map. So what I've done is if I go into, uh, if I just select, if I go into edit mode and select everything so you can see, cool. Oh, 
select everything. Oh, because I got, I've now got two meshes, so let me just, um, can I select both of those and go in edit mode? Yep, apparently I can, cool. So if I just bring up the UV, so this is what it looks like. So the UV, I've got the side of the shuttle, and I've got the, the wing. And the way, I, the way I did that was basically just set myself into a camera mode. And in, in here, you can say UV, and you can just say what kind of project from view. So you can do the same thing as you do in touch with your uh, texture sop, but you can do it just in the, in the software. And what it does, it only does it on the faces you select. So I could just select the wing and say, you know what, I just want a UV, project this from the view, and then it's recreated my UVs, but only for the selected objects. So if I want to select a certain amount of things, I can just select those and then UV map it. And so once you get that, you get this wireframe kind of image. And that wireframe image is now your canvas, uh, which is obviously a little bit of a nightmare to work with in some ways because it's flat. You, don't, you can't see what's going on. Luckily in touch, we can preview that on the model in real time, right? We can just apply a texture to the model and that's gonna work. So what I can do is I can go into, let me go back into my little shuttle scene here. So I just got a wireframe on there at the moment. But if I put on a, uh, let's just put on a constant material and let's bring in, uh, I've got a movie file in the folder and that is uh, not in this folder because I'm in a, I'm in a new project. Uh, if I go into uh, textures, so I've got this shuttle texture here. And this, I just made this in, um, I think I made this in touch actually. <laughs> I could have done it in Photoshop, I could have done it in anything, but um, just, I don't know, touch design is easier for me. So all, what I've done here is I've got this flat texture. You see like I've got the United States is all like proportionally correct, but it's still gonna map on fine because I set up my UVs properly. So when I put that in, into here, and when we look at it, and it should be on the model as well there, uh, yeah, so now, because of my shoddy UV mapping skills, you can see there's a little bit of an edge where my resolution's crap, but everything else should look quite neat on the, on the space shuttle. Yeah, and it does look all right. Uh, it's kind of, the calibration's, you know, <laughs> a bit off because we're... So yeah, so we're working with Flaconic. What's great about Touch Designer is that up until, uh, at the last summit, I made a request, can we have a in, in uh, some competitive software, which I won't name, um, you can set up a UV camera. And Touch Design didn't have that functionality. And Malcolm was like, oh yeah, it takes like two minutes to do. And I was like, okay, we'll do it then. And he did, so. Hmm? Uh, no. <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, it's, um, so what we can do is actually, when we, when we uh, render the shuttle, if I just go out of this and go into a new scene, make myself, so we're gonna go back to creating a, the great thing about this is now, I don't need to create my canvas, I don't need to create my camera setup, I've got it all, because I've got my UV map, I know what's gonna, I know what the shuttle's gonna do. So all I need is my shuttle, so I go into my geometry, uh, and I create a geometry comp, and you guys just watch this, I guess, because it's, it's we're sort of, I'm just gonna have to go through quite quick. So um, I've got my geometry, so I've got my shuttle, uh, I've got my body and my, the black section of the shuttle, so it's the white and black sections, and I'm gonna merge those together so this is my full shuttle. And I I want to view it from the I want to view it from the perspective of what I want to wrap around the shuttle. So what I can do is I can use a, a render top. And I believe in the render top, when I set that up, um, it's got an error because it wants a camera comp. So I can create a uh, actually no, it's not I don't need to create a camera, I'm, I'm getting it wrong. In the render mode, we can switch this to UV unwrap. And what that's gonna do is, apparently it wants a camera anyway. <laughs> Let's create a camera just for the sake of it. All right, it wants a camera and it wants to do a UV unwrap. And my UV wants to be square. So I'm gonna make it like 4096 by 4096, which is a huge resolution. But here you go, here you see our shuttle. Now, what I can do is use the Archibald camera to pre what the shuttle actually looks like, or I can just pre it on the physical model because I've mapped it, right? So I can, I can, I can pre it on there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send this out, and then I'm going to send a null just to set a material up. Sorry, this is me going like into my weird spectrum of figuring out what's going on. Uh, no. Uh, at least I don't think it does. We can check that. Sorry, I've used the wrong node. 
So what I'm doing here, sorry, I'm I'm um, I'm applying this UV now as the material. So this is quite cool because now I've got this I've got this horrible flat thing and I don't know how to work with it, but at least I've got it on my set. So now I actually I can work with my set. So if I want to create a light, I can just create a light in real time, and that light, if I pull it back enough should start lighting up my model there. You should start seeing it on the, yeah. And there you go. So I've got, I've now got this, am I going the right way? I guess I am. So now I can actually like update my light in real time and we can see it on the model. And obviously we don't necessarily have to do this with, um, with the, uh, the physical model. We can do it with a virtual scene and set it up like we did before where we just drag on our textures and bring in a model in the Archibald camera and just move around it. But it's nice to see it, you know, set up as a as a physical thing as well. So, and what the and the, the benefit being is that obviously now now we can play around with that. The the negative side of this is that you can't actually um, you can't set up a perspective camera. You have to. So if you want to work with perspective based content, you then have to set up a second camera and you have to do weird camera blending. So that gets a bit difficult unless unless anyone knows of a way of doing that. But I don't think there's. Uh, any f simple way of doing that. So yeah, so that's that's our now our UV, and obviously now we've got that. Actually, we could say, you know what, we want to, we actually want to physically light this. So if I use a PBR shader, and then I bring in my, um, this is not the cleanest network, but I'll clean it up and put it on the GitHub. Uh, if I want to go on to uh, my UV map, so I can apply my UV map now with a. Um, as a, uh, a texture here, you can see it's very dark right now, and I can use an environment. This is this is a standard um, uh, PBR setup in Touch Designer is to have an environment map um, with a an environment, and I've actually got an environment map here, which is this one. This is free from online, uh, so it's all good, and I just chuck that in, and now we've got an environment mapped shuttle. And I can start playing around with like the metallicness of the shuttle or um, the uh, the roughness. So I can start like making sort of highlights and stuff on it. And I don't know how good that looks on the shuttle itself because it's so small. <laughs> but yeah, so we can start doing that. And then we could also like you know like before we talked about the ramp. Well, you know what? I set my UV up so that it all goes down one plane. So in theory, we should just be able to chuck a ramp on it, right? So if I um, if I make a constant. We can go on here and we can chuck a ramp down our shuttle as well. So that's that should be quite fun. So if I just put that down, then we can um, put in a, a lovely little, one of my favorite uh, things in Touch Designer is this time, uh, it, actually this is the, the obsolete version, so don't put this in. I think it's now just time dot, abs time dot seconds thank you it's actually so ignore that do this abs time dot seconds yeah so that's uh yeah so now i've got i've got some like sort of ramp lines going down you know uh following the actual contour of the of the shuttle there on the so on the projector blending i mean in terms of the setups in touch, I think Keith's is probably yeah, one of the, the most interesting ones. But what what I think what he does is he, when he does the cam schnapper, he actually puts the blend into that, if I remember correctly. So when he when he calculates the camera position, he then adds that in in the cameras in from the camera's point of view. So when you do your individual projectors, you then put that in. Because for the blending on this, the problem the problem is when we when you put two cam schnapper cameras in. You're still going to have to do your blend. It's not going to. This is not going to solve your blending issue. You still need to do the blending in the camera. So, so you do it in camera space, which is basically a, a mask in the camera that can then blend. And I'm not sure if you need any kind of 3D information for that. I think you can just just send a, a ramp and just put the two ramps in the in the camera view. Um, and I don't know if any. Yeah, I, I think I think Keith, uh, Keith Lestrarko is a really good person to ask about that because he built a whole blending system for um, for his luminosity server. Yeah, he's a good he's a good shout, um, and he's here. <laughs> he's gonna hate me because I'm sending you all his way. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so yeah, we could send ramps down and we could do lighting around and um, and all that kind of all that jazz. So. Um,
and if you want to do trace lines, you can do trace lines, but again, you're back into the, the realm of having to draw these things onto the UV map. But hey, you can do that. You can do your trace lines in like After Effects in your UV, click them on, and then you can actually just drive the animation through through touch. So you can you can do the, the live stuff uh, there as well. So yeah, so that's that's kind of the 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 gist of the, the UV mapping sort of uh, I guess the workflow. The hardest part is actually making yeah, making these UVs um, and getting your model prepared. That's always the, the difficult challenge. And as, as also when you're working, actually someone mentioned about 3D scan data. So normally when you do something as complex as a space shuttle, you'll want to scan the whole thing. You want to do the actual 3D scan. Now, so with 3D scans, in the past, I've always just hired somebody to come in. Uh, there's a lot of professional 3D scanning companies, and they come in and they can essentially set up the environment, set up, like, set up the scanner, and they'll give you either a point cloud or they'll send off uh, you know, the file to somewhere like, you know, some, somewhere where they'll get it made really cheaply into a, uh, into like a mesh <laughs> from the company that I use. So like you can end up with like a, they, they can give you like a decimated mesh. But um, one of the things you have to be careful of when you're doing 3D scanning is obviously you want to make sure that the, the points that you want to map to, the calibration points, are in that 3D scan. So you want to make sure that the information is kind of there before you, before you use it. And you don't necessarily have to be have an expensive 3D scanner. You can just use photogrammetry for a lot of for a lot of projects. You know, just take lots of photographs, run it through. Uh, I think it's Agisoft PhotoScan. I think does does the um, the um, I've had a mind blank the uh, camera calibration for that, and it will build you a point cloud, and then you can bring that mesh in. But if you if you if you're going down that road, uh, there's a really f amazing bit of software called MeshLab, and MeshLab is um, MeshLab is free. As there's two. There's Mesh Lab and there's Cloud Compare, and they're both free. And they're hmm? Cloud Compare. Yeah, they're both free, and they're both really good for decimating meshes and then for bringing into touch. So you can do like Poisson disk sampling, and you can like bring it. You can like basically generate triangles around point clouds. And actually, now there's a point cloud top. So I don't know. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but there is actually a point cloud top in Touch Designer, and I'm sure there'll be more point cloud stuff coming now that Rob's around to, to, to do that. So that's, um, what that's, the, the I think it's called Agisoft PhotoScan. Is that right? What's that one, sorry? Reality Capture. Reality capture. All right, cool, well, there you go, Real, Reality Capture, yeah, so. Yeah, but I think when you're, when you're doing large scale events, you really wanna be doing scans. You don't wanna be, cause it, it can get scary when things don't go right on those kind of jobs. Especially if you've got like more than if you've got more than ten projectors, you want to be sort of scanning stuff, regardless of, of what it is. Yeah. Um, cool. So we're at four o'clock. Um, I'm wondering if anyone wants to try and have a bit of play around with the actual sets and stuff or you guys how's everyone feeling? Are you feeling frazzled or are you feeling alive? Good? Yeah, all good. All right, cool. So, what have we done? We've done, we've done a lot. <laughs> we've done quite a lot, actually. Um, so what else can I show on the shuttle side? Maybe I should show some 3D effects using existing meshes as well. Um, two projectors with a blend. Do you want to do that? But what I will do is I'll, show, I'll just quickly see, let's just see if we can figure it out while we're here, why not, um, is we're talking about blending with CamSnapper. So CamSnapper has the automatic blend. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I think for, for what well, all you do with CamSnapper, in fact, if I just go into it here. So all you do with the auto blend is you type your camera names in. So if I've got like CamSnapper, then I've got, I can just type my the paths to my cameras in. And then what it spits out is a, um, in fact, it's the only output out of CamSnapper is the blend mask. So it actually gives you a mask. And then what you would do is you would multiply that mask with um, your set. So in this case, we've got CamSnapper. If I just really quickly copy it and kind of screw it around, it might actually give us something more useful. Uh, one second. Oh, uh, second window. 
Um, oh no. So you would have to so you type in camschnapper and then like camschnapper one, and it'll say it'll give you an error because it always does, um, but it's fine. And then normally that gives you a mask. I think I need we need to get like two projectors going properly to to, to do that. And the, the, this set's so small it's quite hard to do. So, um, but you have the gamma, the gamma and the blending. These 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 are the, like the parameters that would control that. Um, but that's the automatic way to do it. The manual way to do it sometimes is better because when you have like, yeah, some, sometimes it you get like you get like it, it works, but you get like kind of a little bit of a line or something from the auto blends, and you need to actually do it manually. And I guess the way to do that would be um, to actually use the camera and just mask off in the camera. It would probably work fine. So when you so if I, if if I've got this camera now, this is this render here is from my camera's point of point of view. So what I could do is just actually use a linear mask on it, and then on my second camera, I'd use a linear mask on that. And in theory, it should just work. Now I say that, I've never actually tried it. <laughs> but I'm pretty reasonably confident that's how Luminosity does it. I think it's just like a linear mask, and it works. That works really well. So you basically add a, you, you add like an edge blend uh, for each, each corner. Yeah, and in, fact, in fact, there is a projector blend component somewhere in touch, I think. So if I go down, yeah, there's a projector blend component here. So we can actually use that to um, to blend two projectors together. It's really complicated, though. <laughs> uh, in the in, Normally, what I would do is I would just actually use a ramp. Yeah, and then just do it with the ramp. And then have four ramps multiplied together if you want to do soft edges on all four, all four sides. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the probably the best way to do it. Um, is there, is there any Have I got them on here? They're probably on my NAS drive. <laughs> hmm? Sorry? Uh, what have I got? I think most of the stuff I've got in here is actually um, my either projects that haven't happened yet, so I can't show you them, <laughs> or projects that are actually more about, um, yeah, I think most, oh, Luminosity is actually in there. Most of these are projects that are just testing or whatever. My main projects are all in my NAS drive, so it's a little bit difficult to find any. Um, yeah, there's a few LED bits and stuff. Uh, actually, what we could do is I could show you guys the laser stuff. Should we do lasers quickly? Yeah. Mapping? Yeah, but you can you can do stuff with the geometry as well. So like for example, if I wanna uh we did a trick um with we did a job for Con for uh, there's a Concorde in um Bristol Aerodrome, I think it's called, it's the museum. And we did a trick for that where we actually made the, uh, the, the, the Concorde actually like flies out of the Concorde. It like flies off onto itself. So for that you would do something like if you were to have, I mean this is going to be terrible because I'm going to do it with parameters, but so let's say for example we have the shuttle there. We can obviously like, we can do geometry tricks like, you know, like have it um, sort of flying away and so on. So you can actually just use those parameters to sort of, whoa lad. That's interesting. Am I in the wrong? I'm in the wrong section, aren't I? I'm in the bit where it's mapping. I should be in the creative. Oh, it's because I've set it up. This is another thing. So obviously now I've just done what I told you guys not to do this morning. So what I've done here is I've set up my render and I'm working directly creatively in my cam snapper render. And obviously that means I'm no longer tied to my geometry anymore. I can just send stuff out to. So I have to reproject my geometry back onto the model. Like we did this morning, so if we want to do that trick, but I mean you can do so you can do, um, but you can do. In fact, just just I'll just ignore the masking for now. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll cheat it. This is a way of cheating your masks. If you don't want to have to go through all that reprojection stuff, you can just make yourself a nice white render, lock it, and then multiply it back with the original. So yeah. And now, so now when I actually go and do that, it will, um, 
that should now actually transform properly without. Yeah, there you go. So now it's trapped to the model. So what, but what we could do is like we could instance particles and stuff off the geometry. So if I like go in and render some particles, we can birth a, a lo whole load of them. Uh, oh. <coughs> no point one. I don't know how that looks right now. I don't know if it looks good. Yeah, so obviously we, could, we can we can like start putting wind on them and stuff. Uh, let me just. They can fly. So if I put a little bit of wind on, like I don't know, no point. F I don't know. I don't know which way my shuttle's actually oriented right now. I'm just gonna check. Yeah, z-axis. So what I can do is I can say, okay, let's birth some particles, and then let's make it like I don't know, longer, a uh, thousand. All right. So now we should get. Have we got particles moving down, or are they just still? All right. No. I think it's because my. I think it's because this is an actual scale shuttle. Oh, there we are. What? What is going on? Oh, they're going. Are they going down the right axis? Oh yeah, they're going the wrong way. They're going in the. Sorry, they want to go on the z axis. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, Three point two. Oh, the wrong way. Minus. Yeah. So we could do something like this, where we like have the particles coming off. Um, and is is that actually now sending the right way? Yeah. It's getting there. Yeah. You know, we we can play around. I mean. Yeah, random sort. Yeah, we can sort by random, so we can sort the points by random. Woo, and then we get this kind of thing. And then we can obviously do a little feedback loop in there to give it a bit more, uh, a little bit more trace liney look. Um, so if I feedback that, and then, whoa. And does that look any good, or is this still, I can't actually see what I'm doing, so I'm, is that cool? Yeah, so obviously, yeah, you can work with the geometry and do things like, yeah, instancing particles on that. Um, and, yeah, you can mix and match that with pre-rendered and do, you know, I think there's, especially with, with, with the shuttle, it's actually, there's, it's quite difficult, obviously, to create content for because there's all sorts of things you can do. With buildings, it's really easy because buildings, you can just, like, flash, tile, flash like, uh, columns and do, like, you know, lots of... Because they're all square, right? So that's like you can you can just delete primitives out. What I could do actually as well with shuttles to give another example. Um, let me just save that because it's quite nice. Uh, what I can do as well is I could maybe like if I if I do some crazy geometry delete deletion stuff it might look quite nice. But the problem with the shuttle is it's really dense, so deleting uh, primitives is quite crazy. So so what I could do is delete primitives. Uh, I sort I sort my primitives randomly. And then I can delete those by range. So I, I've only got a certain number of uh, faces that are going to be allowed on the geometry. And this is a trick that's quite good with lasers as well. Um, so I delete that. <laughs> and then what I do is in my sort, because I'm sorting random, if I change the seed, in fact, you can't see that. If I change the seed, then you should get, uh, oh, primitive random, sorry. If I change the C, then you start to get these like primitives are all like kind of going crazy. Uh, so if I put that into a uh, a beat uh, or a, or a abs time dot seconds is fine as well. If I abs times times up by like a thousand or something. So now I'm getting like you know crazy geometry stuff. Maybe that's a bit too crazy. Uh, yeah, so I don't know something like this, uh, and then we need to render that out. Then we can do like some sort of crazy mapping stuff like that as well, you know, just kind of playing around. Uh, does it look any good or does it look terrible? <laughs> We're making stuff on the fly, so it's uh <laughs> yeah. And you know, obviously, you can like multiply that with the actual projection map of the um, of the shuttle and stuff. And mm -hmm. is quite important. Yeah, actually, normally when I do a job, I don't actually have one mesh. I have, like, tons of meshes. So actually, oh, this shuttle, same thing, right? So for the shuttle, if we don't want to have the the black section of the shuttle is a separate mesh. Um, hang on, let me go back to the meshes. So this, oh, this is where I was meant to be working all this time. Yeah. <laughs> so the black section of the shuttle is actually separate to the white because I just found it easier for doing the UVing. Because when I did the UV map, I just went, OK, I'm just going to fill in all of that side of the mesh black, all that side of the mesh white, and then add my textures in so it's easier. 
Um, but yeah, the decimation of the mesh is really important. And obviously, like here, you've got this is actually quite a crude uh, setup. You can see here where I've just kind of smashed things in. Um, it's not the nicest model in the world, let's put it that way. Um, but it kind of, you know, it, it works for what we're doing here today, but I wouldn't use it for a, uh, yeah, I wouldn't sell it to a client. Yeah, so like for example with our cube set, so where's our, where's my cube set gone? Oh, it's there. So for the cube set, obviously sometimes you want to like animate all of the cubes individually and then sometimes you just want to do something on the surface. So actually what I do is with touch, a lot of times when you're just working on the surface, you don't want to have all that inside information. So for most for so most of the time I have a I have a, a shell mesh is one of the meshes I'll have. And then I'll have a mesh with all of the cubes intact and then I'll have elements like if I'm doing a building I'll have the windows I'll have the columns I'll have the door I'll have everything as separate elements so if I go okay I want to flash a huge thing across all the windows then I can I can do that um, and, then, and then I'll just like basically mask use that as a mask a geometry mask in touch so that's kind of a, a good way of a good way of making sure that you know you, you can keep things organized um, like we, we used to do Somerset House a lot in London, and Somerset House, you would basically have your columns individually, you'd have the, the windows, and just like flashing the windows, and it, it, we even had the brickwork, because the guy who modeled it, modeled all the brickwork in, so you could like make all the bricks individually, like delete out and so on, so that was quite neat as well. And that's one of the things with this, like with the shuttle, you know, if you, with, if you have like, if you have those elements, then you can actually just use, um, the delete stop's quite powerful for this, in that I can now go in and I can now delete more primitives. Uh, so I can say I'm going to delete by a bounding volume and I can make it like a sphere. So as I delete from the sphere, it's going to sort of bring things in and bring things out. So you can kind of do things like that as well where you're, um, which is quite cool for like if you're doing like columns and you want to like do like, you know, all the columns are going to pulse out and stuff, then that's quite a cool, cool trick to do. Um, there's also another deformer called uh, the twist deformer which might not work so well with a shuttle, but let's just see. Let's just make it, um, let's me just, let me just put the, a thong on or something. Uh, one second. I should really be working in the other folder, but yeah, so if I put a, a twist is quite nice sometimes for certain elements, because you can do weird, like you see, oh, you can see it up there, but I haven't rendered it out. I haven't got a light, have I? That's the problem, yeah. Uh, oh, 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 sorry. Oh, let's just put a light in. So if I have a light in here now, I'm kind of I'm kind of working in the worst way possible in some ways, but yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. So anyway, so I put a twist. I can put a twist on the Z axis or something. Is that going to be good or bad? And you get all the strength. So we can kind of like make it warp the whole mesh. Is now gonna. Is, can you see anything there? No. Oh. That's a topology wireframe. That should be a little bit better for seeing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I uh, twist this now, is it gonna is it gonna work? Oh, I've still got all the feedback on as well, which is not gonna help. So let's get rid of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's z-axis, but you can sometimes like for for doing like building warps and stuff, it's quite nice to use the twist deformer because it can do weird, weird funky things. Uh, but yeah, z-axis is definitely the one. And you've also got like bend. So you can do like bending and stuff, but on a shuttle it's not the best. <laughs> but it's got roll off, and you can like obviously animate the roll off, so you can have things like kind of twisting as they go around and so and so on as well. Uh, and obviously because it's the shuttle, we can we can do things like um, you know what? I'm just going to go back to my UV map because it's easier to manage. Um, right, so that's back to our original. Yeah, let's get out of here. It's crazy. Yeah, so actually, uh, if you want to, you can obviously just like do instancing onto it as well and then have the instances like pulsing down. So if I was to uh, maybe use um, a new, if I just make a, a, some spheres, actually this might look crap because again, it's, a, it's not the, the best mesh in the world for this, but we'll try. But if I, uh, yeah, if I have a, a load of boxes um, that are rendering, and I want to instance those from uh, the merge one. So I just go dot slash merge one. And when I do that, it's going to want me to give some. Oh my god, it does not like that. It's a heavy mesh. 
This is one of the things, well, once you get into like really heavy meshes, you start to get into GLSL land at some point, and that's when things get really complicated. But uh, hang on, let me just, let me just, f yeah, I'm going to resample. Yeah. So what I can do is, yeah, just go and re, hmm? Oh, yeah, loving it. Yeah, so obviously you can resample, you can resample, uh, whoa. I don't know. Let's try that. See if it works. Uh, resample one now. See if this is going to work. Yeah, touch side. The obviously the the SOPs at the moment are on the CPU, so everything's really kind of uh, a little bit heavy still. But uh, once Vulcan, apparently when Vulcan comes, it's going to be the GPU SOPs, and that's going to be like super quick, and it's going to be great. Um, so that 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 will speed up this process, and it does not like that either. Oh. I think I saved. I think I saved. Yeah, I could hear your, your computer and he was crying. Screaming, like, screaming yeah. computer. I'm guessing it's shuttle.to. Uh, hmm. Yeah, sorry. That's, that's just a classic. You have to have at least one crash during a workshop, about three hours into doing something. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't be instancing on it. Oh, well, we're back to the particle bits. That's nice. At least that looks good. Actually, we should probably just instance on these particles, right? Because there's probably less of them than there was on geometry. It's going to look nicer. So if I uh, open up a separate window. So if I instance on these, that's probably going to be cooler. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a little box. The thing is, you can now render particles as lines as well. So I think if you use a line sop, that's probably going to look quite cool. But so if I use uh, the line mat, sorry, there's a new material. I say new, it's been there a while now, but um, yeah, so sorry. So we're going to instance off uh, out one. And let's, ah, oh, that's a bit better. It's actually doing something. Whoa, lots of spheres. In fact, there's so, lots of cubes, rather, and they're so dense that you can't actually see anything. So, wow. Yeah, so I mean, that's pretty. That's pretty intense, isn't it? Yeah, so we're starting to create almost like point cloud looking stuff. That's why. Let's get rid of that. So now we've got some cubes, and uh, those could be uh, doing some random rotation or something as well. Um, how big are they? Uh, they're not that big. So if I uh, put on uh, format, palm material. I'm working in the wrong space again. Maybe I'll put some rim lights on there, see if it does something. So that's like adding a bit more variation in, I guess. Um, and then if we, is that working? And we can like make them randomize with some noise chop and set that to like 1,001 uh, samples, 1,001 samples. Oh, times 1,001. Okay, so now we can use like the noise to drive the scale or something as well. So it might go a bit crazy, but um, oh, you can't do that on this bit yet, can you? Uh, that needs to be. So you can mix chops and sops when you're doing the instancing stuff to kind of uh, merge that all together. So that's going to merge, and hopefully now it's actually at the right sample rate: one thousand one, one thousand one, one frame, sixteen seconds. Oh, this is the. You know what? Let's just go back down to 16.01 seconds. Yeah, it's noise is a bit 16.01. And is that actually going to... 1001. You have to make sure that your samples match up to your SOP, um, which is a bit annoying. But when you merge, you can say uh, stretch to maximum. Where is that? Stretch to, stretch to max. Is that right? Yeah, now I've got 1,001 on the right sample rate, which is what I wanted, yeah. Um, so now I can use this chop rather than my output. So I can see merge one. Yeah, it's because I haven't got a, something's wrong. Oh, these are probably now changed, have they? Oh, of course they have. And then now should be like different sizes for the different uh, particles on there, so. <laughs> Yeah, it gets, we're getting there. <laughs>
but you can use like the clip and stuff as well. There's lots of sop tricks to kind of make this look a little bit better. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a yeah, it does what it does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I'll, I'll show some, like, because this is the thing is that we, I'll just quickly show, like, some effects from um, what we, what I've, these are projects that I've done, but uh, I uh, I haven't got the projects, I've just got the videos, annoyingly, so I could show you a couple of videos, maybe, but, yeah. And our internet's not working. I'll show you the Concord, actually, because you can get an idea of the kind of things you can do. Uh, so if I go to work... <coughs> So this is, uh, da, 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 da. oh, here you go. So this is actually, um, this was something that I did, the, yeah, did a, did a bit of tech. I actually didn't make the content on this. So I just did the, some of the tech setup. But uh, yeah, it's just to show like kind of, this mesh was like really clean. Like it was super, super clean. Um, and they, they only did the front of it. Um, but oh, they love an intro. Let's just get to the projection. So there you can see like you can do like obviously, these kind of effects where you're pulling off and stuff, you obviously need to have, and when you're uh, extruding in, you need to have really clean geometry in order to do those. You can't just do them on like any old mesh. You need to actually, no, no, this is this is all ren rendered. Yeah, this is rendered, yeah. But just to show like, but this is like a really clean mesh where they've they've done all that on. Whereas uh, with, with ours, we're in a little bit more of a uh, complicated, uh, horrible, Mesh that I downloaded from the internet. So yeah. Mm. Depends on the depends on the job. Uh, so if it's really complex, uh, like things with where you have like like we had one job where we had lots of buildings and the buildings would actually physically move down and we project onto the build onto a single building. So that needed to have a UV map all the way around, whereas other jobs where you're just doing like just straight like camera projection mapping, then we just use the perspective camera. And then we bring the perspective camera in. And obviously the good thing about the perspective camera is you don't have to set that up in Touch Designer. You can set that up in C4D. You can do your stuff in C4D, and then you can bring that into Touch Designer and then composite your real-time elements on top of the original um, pre-rendered stuff. So you never, you never really, like, there's a couple of shows I've done where I've done entirely touch, but you don't always want to be using touch. You want to be using touch with the tools that you want to use because, you know, that's the whole idea, right? You're creating, you're creating content to go in and, but touch is always like very good as a, it, it can do all the things. It can do all the things like to a, to a level which is acceptable, but you might want to push with other things to, to bring in and, um, so like, uh, f like f for us, we used to do a lot of C4D, a lot of After Effects, and then I would just come in and do like real-time trace lines or real-time like flashing and stuff on top. Right now, we're doing a show, in, me and me, we're doing a show where we've got a projection mapping show in disguise, and we're doing all the laser stuff on top in Touch Designer because Touch is really good for controlling lasers, and we can, and it's not even like real-time laser stuff. We're animating it all in Touch, but it's Touch has got great laser out capabilities. So, the LTC comes in from disguise, it controls touch, and touch does all of the, the, uh, the real time. Uh, well, it's all in real time, but it's yeah, doing all the mapping and so on. And then some of the content we rendered out of touch and put back into disguise. So it's, you know, you're always, you're always kind of just using those workflows however you want to use them. Sorry, what's that for? Concord's disguise. Yeah, yeah. So either have you been in real time, or do you mean just send, just putting it into the timeline? All right. So, well, the easiest, to be honest, the easiest way is I've got this. Um, I've got my UV map right here. So let's say we have disguise has got it's doing all the projection mapping and everything. We want touch to go in. I mean, we can just send this UV map out through NDI or something, and now that can be brought into disguise because it's using so NDI is a uh, the network protocol for transferring textures. Well, yeah, yeah, so what we can do is we can, so at the moment, obviously I'm rendering from the cam snapper camera, but if we wanted to, we could render this from the UV map, the UV unwrap, oh, which is not correct. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, no, but basically, um, 
we could send either the perspective camera out and then match it in disguise, because disguise and touch designer have the same camera coordinate system. So if you want to bring a camera from touch into disguise, I mean, you could just type values in if you want to do that. Because uh, I don't think disguise lets you import cameras. You have to type values in. Uh, but the other option is, yeah, you, you do your, you would just render this from the UV unwrap uh, mode. Um, Oh, because my camera's set to cam snapper, it seems to be doing some weird stuff. But normally, you could just render from there. So actually, if I did my particles, rather than doing my particles in here, in fact, if I did my particles all the way back at this level, uh, and just let's just render from here. Yep. Yeah. So now I've got my particles going. They're probably going in the right direction. Yeah, so now I've got my particles rendering from this view. They're coming into my... Oh, a mat is present. Da, da, da. Oh, because I need to have a, um, a constant. There's something crazy going on, of course. Am I rendering everything else still? Oh, I'm rendering this box. OK, that can go away. And I'm still probably instancing. It's interesting. Apparently, I don't have UV attributes on. Ah, because when you render, OK. So that's actually something interesting that you've just discovered. So when you render from the UV map, it can only render the UV object as rendering, which is not. No, but that is something actually, to be honest, we should be able to. What you could do is, hang on, let me just think of as a way to do. What you can do is you can use this SOP to create a UV unwrap and then map the particles back on. But actually, that's a feature request. I think that should be in there. You should be able to specify the UV unwrap camera, a uh, mesh, the UV unwrap mesh, and then be able to do. Mm. Actually, I'm not sure how you would do that, because what you can do here is I could. So I could. I could say, um, I could reorganize my points to have my texture coordinates. We're really going down the rabbit hole now. <laughs> I could reorganize my points to be, um, so if I go back here now, so now I've got, this is my, apparently my UV map, but it doesn't look very good, uh, probably because I have to facet everything first. But yeah, you could, hang on a second, there you go, so there's my UV map now as a geometry. So what I could do is projection map back onto it and render it from an orthographic camera. So what is, uh, Guys, derivative. <laughs> what? How how does this happen? <laughs> Ivan? You don't know. I hit W and apparently that turns I have got no control over my viewers anymore. <laughs> oh. Save. Reload. I've seen that happen like once or twice before, but I lost all my active viewers. All all the bottom of my nodes all just disappeared. Yeah. Is it Shift A? What is? Oh yeah, it's still there. Shift A. That is the worst shortcut <laughs> known to man. <laughs> oh well, it works now. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, Shift A. All right. I've been using Touch for 11 years now, and I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know about that shortcut. All right, cool. So, yeah. So what I can do, yeah. Sorry. So I can. I, hmm? Oh, so, yeah. So what I could do is I could un, I could create my own geometry and do my own kind of style UV unwrap by applying the particles to that. But it's a bit crazy. Uh, it would be nicer if you could actually just set the UV as like a camera and then be able to just project from. Yeah. Um, I'll bring that up with Malcolm, because that's actually quite a good suggestion. I think that would be quite cool if you could do that, yeah. Um, yes, it has to be pre-UV'd. So They're not pre-UV'd, and if you try and do the UV unwrap, then that's, that's what I'm saying, is you'd have to like try and set up a... But you could maybe do it from... Yeah, it's a bit weird. You could maybe just do some kind of weird camera conversion with that. I don't know, it's a bit strange, yeah. 
I'll bring that up with Malcolm because he 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 put that in, and it's actually I think that would be interesting if we could if we could do that. Because for, for putting lights and stuff around, right, it works really well. But obviously, when you do particles, you need to have a a camera. Yeah, well, that's it exactly. You need you need that you need that uh, UV map. Yeah. Okay. Ah, right. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. Food for thought, yeah. That is actually a, a point, yeah. Okay, where are we at? What time are we at? Quarter past four. Whew. How are you all feeling? How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling all right, but I was, wondering, uh, I, was, I was going to talk a little bit about lasers. Does, is anyone okay? Laser. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. So lasers are a little bit, actually, to be honest, I started playing with lasers this week. So this is still an ongoing uh, experiment and discussion. So lasers, um, uh, well, I've got a three watt, um, I've got a one watt laser and I've been lent a three watt laser and it's by, oh, I can't remember the name of the company now. I can figure it out, I'll remember for you, I'll find it out later. But, um, uh, the in terms of the kit that I'm using is the AVB, the um, laser animations are called. I can't even remember that now. Yeah, I've been using it for a week. So, laser animation, the uh, Solinger, the Solinger's stuff is really good. That's uh, I've got a Helios. Helios is it's okay for just testing, but it, it can have a little bit of crackle in it. Um, and this right here is the Ether Dream, which is apparently good, but I've never used an Ether Dream before. So we're about to find out how that works. So if I just, uh, hmm? yeah, I'm just going to show a little bit about warping and stuff and how it, yeah. No, it was the render, the render top. <laughs> sorry? With the what, sorry? Uh, the heel, uh, the Solinger. I think it's called it's yeah the, I think it's called it Solinger. Yeah. <clears throat> it's basically like a switch, and then the, it's a switch, and then there's two boxes. There's an a, a, there's AVB to ILDA and then ILDA to AVB, and they have their own kit. It's Laser Animation who make it. Then the Laser Chop I think works best with that. Yeah, yeah. So so Laser Chop works really well with that. It, it, the Helios it does work well with, but sometimes when you're in the network and you move around, it can kind of give a little bit of noise. So that's kind of. Um, and apparently the Ether Dream 2 is good, um, but I guess we're going to find out. Am I on? Is that actually in on position by default? That's good. That's safe. When you're playing with lasers in Touch Designer, you have to be super careful because you can set fire to stuff so easily. Um, so just a, a word of warning before you... Yeah? Right, so anyway, so when, we, when you're using lasers, uh, the first thing to know is that the cam snapper does not work with lasers. Um, I tried modifying it for lasers. Marcus has had a little bit of a, a shot with it. And I think it's something to do with, the, well, Marcus, I say I, Marcus thinks it's something to do with the fact that you have polar coordinates and lasers, whereas in projectors, you're, you know, you've got a square uh, sort of setup. So, what, why? Oh, you mean you want me to move around? Yeah, maybe, uh, in case I get blind. Yeah, also never look into a laser. <laughs> I'm going to move around this way a bit so I'm not so uh, in, in the throw of it. Yeah, so what we, what we discovered is that, um, so when you're working with lasers, you have, you have a, bit of a, a bit of a problem in that you use the, um, well, you use the Ether Dream out for controlling this particular controller. AVB uses the audio device out. Helios has its own uh, output. Um, oh, and there's a network address, which I don't know the IP of. Um, this is going to be fun. We might be swapping to the Helios in a second, so let's just see. Uh, and then we have the laser chop, and Eric made the laser chop, and it's all very lovely, um, and it works very well. The first thing you want to do on the laser chop is, when you go to output color, is turn the scale down to like 0 0.05 or something. And the reason for that, before you plug anything into it, because the reason for that is, uh, if you don't, you might end up sending a very, very, very harsh point at 
in one place at full brightness, and that will burn through stuff. Like it, it will actually. Um, yeah, so you have to be you have to be super careful when you're using lasers. And lasers don't accept um, video; they accept geometry. So you so let's say for example we have a circle, we can put that circle in, and in theory it might work. But let's see, mm, no, because there's IP addresses. <coughs> A bit weird. Uh, what I might. Oh, is that what you do, do you? I've never used an EtherDream before. Ah, look at that. It's not connected. Um, that should be working, right? Hmm? Pull, hmm? pull devices. Oh, look at that. We We're all working together. We're getting there. 192, 254. Uh, and then we got one two six one two one. Cool. So anyway, so apparently you use the Ether Dream Dat to get the information. Yeah, one six nine. Cheers. Yeah, cool. So you use the Ether Dream Dat, and we're on port six seven six five four to send our laser. Now that should be sending out, but I am sending out a really small scale. So let's just try boosting that up. Uh, no. Is our laser set up to ILDA output? Doop, doop, doop. Sorry. Oh, it doesn't have a. It doesn't have. It's just switches. This is fun. It's got power, but it's got no signal. Okay. Learning the hard way. <laughs> oh, good shout. Is that actually on or off? Yeah, it could be my network adapter as well, actually. It could be that I'm on a static IP, which is more than likely. So if I go in here, uh, I am on IPv4. Oh, look at that. I'm on a, I'm on a static IP. Let's try that. No, it wants me to be on the same IP range, probably. 169.254.126.141. Oh, 141. No, 121, yeah. You know what? I'm just going to use the Helios, because I know it. it's better. Uh, one second. Where's my Helios gone? Ah, yeah. So the the Helios is uh, not network based. It's actually just a USB device. So it's kind of probably easier to use. In fact, let me move this way. So it's just not as nice as apparently the Ether Dream, but it'll still do. It'll work for what we're showing today. So let me just plug that in. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right, cool. So, just delete that out, Helios out. In fact, this kind of sh this is probably quite a good demo in a way because you can see how the Helios uh, works. Ah, uh, we're not getting anything because something's turned off. Ah, there we go. Way okay. So yeah, so lasers, it just sends out geometry. So you can obviously like you can center your geometry, um, and you can bring it up. So if I bring it up here, you can kind of see there. Our laser's just aiming at the corner of the room, uh, so I can sort of change my geometry around in here, and it will go in. Now. <laughs> With lasers, what you can do is you can do you can do like mapping with lasers. So if I have a rectangle, for example, and I want to just put a mapping on that wall, then I can use a rectangle, uh, and you'll see it's got this really horrible curved edge by default, and that's because we have this um, this thing called the vertex hold parameter in the laser chop, and we can actually bring that up, and now we've got a nice little square. And the way we the way we map uh, the laser chop. So uh, when we do our stoner stuff, we do the corner pin. Well, actually, inside the stoner, what it's doing is it's actually corner pinning a piece of geometry, and they've actually released that derivative released that as something called the corner pin sop. So what we can do is we can actually do corner pinning, perspective based corner pinning, with this sop, and we can bring that in, and we can attach it to a. Oh, if I put a null, sorry. We can then attach that, and now I can actually like corner pin my laser, so I can actually control my uh, mapping of that laser. So that's all kind of cool, and it kind of works. Now, where it gets complicated is um, 
we have a with this it's fine because we're on a flat surface but once you start doing sets you've got a huge amount of geometry and what you have to do is you have to map that geometry now the problem with mapping geometry with lasers is that when you want to do creative on the geometry it's not necessarily to the edges of the geometry and to give an example of that we were asked to do uh, last week a countdown and the countdown obviously we have a number three so three is great. We can put that in, and it will start doing. And well, it will start doing a number three very slowly because there's so many points. Um, if I just set this to open polys, there we go. So we have a number three. Now the problem is, how do we projection map that number three? We've got so many points in there, and if we want to projection map that in the in relation to a set, it becomes really complicated because we have so many elements to the set, and this three is sitting on a face in the middle of the set. So. Using the corner pin stops great for rectangles, but if we're then do if we're using something like the vertex pusher, when we move move a verte vertice, we're affecting the texture, but we're not affecting the actual geometry between that. And the way we can do that in touch is by using what's called the lattice sop. So the lattice sop will allow you to actually translate based on a lattice. And it gets very complicated because the lattice has to be your your set basically. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna I'm just going to make a quick. Uh, I'm just going to make like a quick grid, for example. Uh, da, da, da. And I'm going to just poly it, maybe less, maybe five by five, right? So we have a grid, and our three will sit somewhere in this grid, right? So our three is going to be um, quite small, but our three doesn't sit on the grid. It sits in a space in the middle of the grid. So the problem we have there is that we don't have, so if our three is here, for example, I'm just gonna maybe move it up a little bit. Um, yeah. So our three sits there and that looks great until we start to map it. So when we do a corner pin, it should work in theory. So when we do a corner pin, see it sits in the right place. The so three is still in that quadrant. But when we start doing vertex mapping, so if I sort of, if I go, okay, I'm gonna, Take that mesh, so let me just hook it up again. I'm just going to use a, a point sop um, and a group, uh, sorry, a group sop and a transform sop. So if I group, let's say, let's say I want to move this point here, which is 104, because that's on my set. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to move point 104. So I'm going to say group, points. We want to create a new group. We're going to make pattern 104. This is a way of moving an in individual point without having to use dats. Um, and then what I can do is I can say select that group and I can translate. So there we go, so we're moving um, that point. The three doesn't move. And the reason the three doesn't move is because the three is not attached to that point in any way. So that's where the lattice comes in. So what we do is we use, um, rather than using this, gr so this group and transform, we're still gonna use that, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a lattice uh, to control it. So the lattice expects on the first input, rest, well, the first input's your mesh, what you want to distort. The second input's your rest geometry, and then the third input is your deformed geometry, so what you've warped, basically. So if I take in the rest geometry is this group, and the transform is our warp geometry. And then when we set deform type, we have to say to points. And what it's gonna do is it's now gonna deform our model uh, depending on, um, depending on the actual values that we put in here. So by def I've discovered today, this morning, that Blin model set with a low radius should work well. And it won't work because I think we need a little bit of, um, that's strange, it should work. It's not deforming now, great. Deform points, duh, duh, duh. We should have that three should be moving. That's strange. I don't know if that's a bug or... One second, sorry, let me just figure out what's going on. Three, deform. Nope. I wonder if it only works on polygons and this is, no, it's open polygons. Hmm, strange. Hmm? Oh yeah, good shout, actually. Is the grid a polygon? Yes, it is, but maybe I just need to put in some, this morning I discovered I had to put in subdivision to make it work um, on both of these, which makes it quite heavy, but it does, it's still reasonably all right. But um, 
Oh, hang on. W. Oh, now everything's moving. Oh yeah, the three is moving if you subdivide it enough. It just needs to be subdivided in order to, to get that de deformation. But yeah, so the, the, the way you have to do it at the moment is through this lattice system. So it's a bit crazy um, for now. There is actually, so the, the, there is an option to use a camera uh, with the laser, but if you use cam snapper, that doesn't work. It just, it won't, it, it, it works in the sensor, but then on the edges you get like a little bit, it's a little bit out. So it'd be quite cool, I think, in the, in the next like couple of months, hopefully, I, I'm gonna have a look at making a laser version of cam snapper to be able to do the, cam, the camera mapping, but for lasers rather than projectors. Because at the moment, this is the only way you can actually warp a laser based on, um, based on actual, you know, touch designers built-in tools. So it's a bit, it's a bit clumsy. You can corner pin. Corner pinning is great, but you can't. Yeah, you can't. Uh, you can't map. You can't mesh warp things in, and you can't use the camera calibration. So for three D objects, it becomes it becomes a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to go over on lasers. Um, where are we at now? We at five? Yeah. You could use, I mean, to be honest, you could set up your own like version of Kantan using the corner pin SOP, and it would probably work fine because you're just corner pinning. But if you want to, so the problem with, the problem with um, when, you're doing, when you're doing like big sets with lots of meshes is that you've then got to like make a corner pin for every single one. You've got to like map everything properly in, and it becomes really clumsy. And, uh, and, and then when you, when you want to do, when you want to start like working with the laser, you then got to like work with a warped mesh rather than working with the mesh that you want, you know, with, from your camera point of view, and then warping it. You've got to like warp your mesh first and then do everything else. So it's a bit, it's all a bit backwards uh, at the moment. But obviously the laser shop's new, and this is all like kind of, this is like all brand new stuff coming in. So it's kind of sort of cool to see that, you know, in the next few months, we'll probably be able to do full on laser mapping shows with with touch it should be really cool but exactly exactly yeah so you would you would set up your camera and then all you would do is is have your um you would have your your rendered content would be done with the texture but then your sop content which your laser content would just be done in sops so you would just do it in geometry as you would with a laser so there's this kind of yeah this weird sort of I mean, Mar I, know Mar I know Marcus has been looking into it, so we've, we've all kind of, yeah, been thinking about it. So it should be, I reckon within the next two months, well, I have to get it, I have to get it working by the end of October because I've got a show using it, so <laughs> I don't have a choice. <laughs> but yeah, so hopefully we'll have something, yeah, cool to show by then. Cool, I think we're, I think we're good. I think, uh, yeah, we've got through a lot. <laughs> 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 if anyone wants to have a play, come and have a